we have a clear night. The clouds have left. We finally have some clear skies and it looks like it's going to be that way for the rest of the night. Now, it might change a little bit. There might be a little bit of um, some clouds that are going to roll in. However, it, just, it looks so much nicer for the rest of the night. Pretty much 11 p.m. Uh, British. No, actually, no, we're in Greenwich Mean Time now. We've gone back an hour. So, yeah, we have some clear skies lined up. That's really exciting because finally the weather has held up and I couldn't be happier. So, I am Tom. I am the Astro Canuck. And it is my pleasure to be bringing you live images from space. Right now, actually, I am shoot. I started a, a exposure before I got going, and it is a 16-minute exposure of the Pac-Man Nebula, um, NGC 281, one of my favorite nebulas. It's been, I've captured it really wide field, I've captured it wide field, and I've captured it in deep sky now, and I'm just, it's just a beautiful target to look at because there's so much to it. There's, um, yeah, it's, there's a lot of nebulosity around it that's really, really faint that people can really bring out the time. And, and that's going at like multiple days worth of exposures to get some of that amazing detail around there. And in this nebula, it is an emission nebula. So it is perfect to be using my uh, one shot color, uh, my narrow band one shot color filter. And that is an Altair Astro brand. And Hey there, Pops. See you there on Facebook. Come on over to Twitch. The water's warm. <laughs> and yeah, it's uh, again, just one of my favorite nebulas to photograph because there's so much to it. There's so much going on in there. It is a star forming region. There are these little tiny buck globule clouds that are eventually going to form their own star systems. And really, who knows what kind of goes on, what's going to go on around in those areas in billions of years from now. So, yeah, definitely a lot, a lot going on in this nebula. And it is just under a minute to go. So, it, like I said, it's a 16 minute exposure that we're doing right now. And we will get that in a second. But just to quickly jump over to Stellarium to give you an idea of where we're at. So in Cassiopeia, that is the kind of W-shaped constellation that you'll see in the night sky. And this will be the object that we are photographing right now. And really that should be done in about 20 seconds. But the Pac-Man Pac Nebula gets its name from well, it looks like the classic video game character, Pac-Man. Because there is this dark cloud that's kind of cutting off the uh, emission, emissions there. With the light coming from it, that basically looks like his mouth. However, there have been some other people who have taken much longer exp exposures and is liking it more to an owl, where this point is actually more of its the beak. Yeah, I, I can see it and really I think just the way how um, almost the way how you can orient the way you photograph the image can also alter your perception of what it really looks like so that exposure is complete for the Pac-Man Nebula there But this is, actually before we go into this photo, let me give you a rundown of actually what we're, uh, what we're imaging with tonight. So. Well, we are imaging with an invisible telescope tonight. There we go. Uh, so this is the 
telescope that we're using. It is the Altair Astro Richie Christian 8 inch telescope. And it is a mirrored scope. So I am using, you got two mirrors that we're using to catch the light coming through. There's the primary mirror at the at the back of the scope, which reflects up into the secondary mirror at the front and comes back into our camera, which is a ZWO ASI 533MC Pro cooled astronomy dedicated camera. That is a mouthful. However, it does a lot of work, so it, it'll, uh, it deserves the pomp and circumstance. Uh, just actually, just to the right, we're gonna see there's our, uh, what's the 80, about 88, 86% moon. And that's just going behind the houses. This is the one, the one time when the houses are acceptable. <laughs> this is where I'm fine with the house because the moon is going to go behind there, and we're going to be able to have less, a little less impact on the sky. Also, I'm not really shooting in the area of the moon, so it shouldn't be too much of a, of an impedance on our images. And yes, the old balls. Hey, pops, switched over to Twitch now. Thanks, thanks for popping in here. Yeah, like I said, this is a Altair Astro 8-inch Richie Chrétien telescope. I am using a Skywatcher EQ6R Pro mount, and it is being guided by an ASI 120mm mini camera. And the guide scope is a Skywatcher 50ED Evo Star, and that guide scope has worked out really well for me. And I. Yeah, I got, I got no complaints about it. Actually, you know, if I was to say a con about the thing is that the, the focuser can be a little stiff on there and when you're trying to get like fine tuning for your guide scope, it can be a little, it can be a little jittery, but it is, it can still be forgiving at the, the focal length that it's at. And it actually, for the most part, when uh, people are doing deep field astrophotography, you want to, almost use an off-axis guider where instead of having the camera up on top of the scope you're going to have a the camera along your imaging train that will have a little prism that will pick off some light coming through and that's where it'll guide so you're actually using pretty much the same focal length as the scope uh, to guide so you're not there isn't any kind of discrepancy because the guide scope I'm at is sitting at about 200 and 50 millimeters, whereas the main imaging scope is at 979 millimeters. So there can be a little um, discrepancy between those focal lengths where at 250 millimeters, it isn't gonna guide as precise as if you are shooting at the same focal length. But for the most part, it's worked out pretty well for me. And for what I'm doing for all this, I'm not too fussed about it. So let us go back into the ASI Air. Now, in terms of Baba Zelnik, hello mother. <laughs> Good to see you on here too. Um, hi, hello. How are you guys doing? Hope you're keeping well over there. Now, I am the, I am in the UK. This is from the east of Essex, and we finally, like I said, we finally have a clear night. And yeah, it's definitely, definitely exciting because there's, right now there's almost too much in the sky that we want to be imaging. So let's not waste much more time trying to get some more images. We will take a look at the Pac-Man Nebula and That is, I'm shooting with the ASI Air uh, Raspberry Pi controlled computer. And I'm controlling this through my laptop by using a program called BlueStacks, which is an Android emulator. And basically it works the exact same way as you would be using your mobile phone. Because it, like I said, it's an emulator and it acts exact same way. However, issues I had in the past was I had to have my camera, sorry, not the camera, the, uh, the, the computer connected through TeamViewer to try and 
run my laptop on Twitch. And it was a bit of a hassle. And finally, I did figure out a way to control my ASI Air with the Bluetooth, oh, sorry, with the Bluetooth, with the Blue Stacks by having my Wi Fi connected to the ASI Air, but then my computer is hooked up by the Ethernet cable. And I'm able to control the ASI Air from a laptop and still be able to stream, which is great because it's a more integrated system, less there hasn't been any dropouts from it where a team viewer would disconnect all of a sudden. So I'm happier with that. So the image that we that I was that I started shooting a little earlier just before I started going, because it does take it's a 16 minute image, and I usually am gonna be shooting like five or ten minute images to try and get uh, our shots tonight. So all I'm gonna do is this is what we're seeing out of here. This is the image straight out of the camera. This is all we're really going to see. So what you do have to do is run a, a histogram stretch and it will do an auto stretch on there. So I'm just hitting the auto button. And it's just going to give us a much clearer image of what we're looking at. There's been, like I said, no processing done on this. It's just stretching the the histogram on there and let me bring out some more details and brighten that up add a little more contrast there and you can hopefully you can see why this is one of my favorite nebulae because there's just so much when I first started shooting this at about 400 millimeters I thought it looked great I'm like excellent I'm finally catching catching this at a at a decent focal length using a good telescope and the camera was all right but then I started using the um, the ASI uh, dedicated astronomy camera and yeah it's just being able to pull out those those greater details that I never actually thought was possible from my back garden Like I said, these, I've got a little bit of movement there, but that's okay. There is a little bit of a breeze out tonight. So, and again, at a 16 minute image, I wouldn't expect everything to be tack sharp um, with some winds going on. So that's understandable and that's all right because still able to see just those details in the cloud uh, and those, those gases that are being basically blown away by star formation and as the cloud expands outwards so all this these gases are being excited the electrons are being excited by the um, by the stars by the radiation that they're giving off in the in, in this area but being able to move in at this kind of focal length you just really get an idea for the depth of everything and I think that's amazing to amazing to see just how much detail I'm able to pull out of there and what I had never thought was possible before so yeah this is like almost like this little this little dark cloud this little buck globule is probably one of my favorite parts of this nebulae for some reason it's just this this lonely little cloud and I say it's a lonely little cloud this thing is probably this cloud here is probably twice the size of our no actually you can see that there's stars that are around it the immensity of this one little cloud so let me get some quick information on the Pac-Man nebula here Now I use a program, I use actually I use many programs to kind of plot out my, what I'm gonna shoot for the night and just kind of get some information on things there. So the Pac-Man Nebula is about 10,000 light years away. I 
this gives you get an idea of how large this yeah, being 10,000 light years away that's about a hundred about ten times farther than the Orion Nebula and the Orion Nebula which will be kind of coming up uh, available for me in the next couple weeks actually well probably later late late in the evening it'll be kind of visible just between the the houses so that's a, a very tight target at the moment but once kind of December rolls around it's gonna be much higher in the eastern sky and be able to get some more images of that and I'm really excited to get that because I really haven't imaged Orion almost since I first got my telescope um, actually my first telescope so and that was with uh, my older camera which I'm filming with now and also with my older mount which is now moved on to a new owner which is hopefully they're getting some great use out of that and it's gonna be really exciting to see what kind of comes what I can get out of there especially even using a new filter as well because the last time I shot it I didn't even have a filter and I was able to about a season afterwards I was able to get another filter but that was more of a broadband filter and like I said this is a narrow band so I'm only catching the narrow band of hydrogen alpha oxygen 3 and hydrogen beta so being able to see the Orion Nebula in a much narrower band is going to be really really cool and very interesting to see how that's going to turn out so I will save that down and main screen here so we got uh, an idea of where we're at so you say yeah save that down let's change the exposure time to to um, let's go five minutes and we will bump up the gain which is kind of like increasing the ISO on a camera I'm going to do half the time and let's double the gain and see how that goes. You can kind of see, I see the trees moving a bit there. So like I said, we got a little bit of wind going on at the moment. So like, that's why I'm going to drop it down to five minutes and um, see how that works out there the music makes this exciting thank you it's not too loud is it because you can never find that right mix of things don't want to be overpowering let me know if you can't hear me over the music so while we're while I'm picking the next target I do want to thank a couple of our latest followers and it is Jay Tango and Mojo Jojo 671 thank you very much for giving a follow and yeah appreciate uh, appreciate you guys uh, contributing to the to the channel and hopefully what I'm working towards is to get at least 50 followers and basically working towards becoming a twitch affiliate and that will kind of open up some more options lower it a bit all right one says good one says lowered a bit let's put it down just a tiny bit there i'm going to stay in this kind of this rough area of the sky and we will go after the what I've actually tried to do before when the clouds rolled in and hopefully this isn't a cloud attracting target I'm going to go back on the heart of the heart nebula and that is also IC 18 no 13 1805 and also known as Malat 15 
your dad's old. Well, he's young at heart. All right, we're going to move on just a, a slight detour. We're still in the constellation of Cassiopeia. We will be choosing the Heart Nebula. And that is, like I said, IC1805. Now, the great thing about the ASI Air is that they've added a few more catalogs to it, which is opening up some more options. And <laughs> all right, play nice, you two. <laughs> and some more catalogs in in here, allowing us to choose uh, some different things there. Mojo Jojo, thank you, stopping by. Appreciate it. Glad you can. Uh, glad you're able to catch the stream. Like I said, we finally got a clear clear night. And we're able to get some imaging done and no more just processing some old photos that I've taken we are looking at images live from space and this is the telescope that we're using right now and I'm just going to pick a new target and we'll uh, we're gonna change things up a little bit and we will do some five minute exposures rather than some ten minute ones because a, I'm not only I'm not going to trust the weather completely, but I'm confident that it's going to be clear for the rest of the night. And B, it's a little windy, so I don't need the telescope shaking in the wind. So we'll do a little shorter exposures. But we will set that to to move on over. And while that's doing its thing, it's gonna make sure we're on the right target there. So even just by the looks of what I'm seeing for these stars, it looks like we are right in, right where I want to be. So that is, that's perfect. So just make sure that the guiding is on a decent star, which it's not. So usually when you're picking it, when you're picking a guide star, you want something that's not going to be too bright. Otherwise, it's not going to be able to follow it and make sure that the mount is going in the right direction. You want something that's just, what I'm looking for is a number to about between 3.5 maybe and 2.5. And so really sitting at three, that's gonna be a perfect star to use because even if it does get a little hazy, it's bright enough that it's gonna be able to still punch through those clouds and keep the guiding going. So I'm going to just make sure that it knows where we are. And I'm going to start that exposure. And that's going to run for five minutes with the camera using the, uh, it's an astronomy dedicated camera that cools the sensor down to sub-zero temperatures. And what that does, it just kind of gets rid of any noise that would come from doing like a long exposure with your regular kind of camera, um, with your mobile camera. So that just kind of gets rid of any of that noise and you're left with just a better signal, which is, uh, you got a clear image to work with right off the bat. So I've always been fascinated with astronomy, uh, like using Google Earth charts to look at the stars. I, I'm glad you're this is and you come to the right place because I am very happy to be sharing all of this with you with uh, with everybody, and 
yeah, like any questions that you got, I'm gonna do my best to answer them. I've been doing astrophotography for the last four years, four and a half years now, and I've learned an immense amount of the night of the night sky about what what uh, you kind of need to do to get a good photograph. Um, I've been studying astronomy, so it's yeah, it's just it. It's, I love talking about it, and I could really talk about it as as long as I, I, I want, I can, I want to, as long as anybody will, will allow me to. Um, and really, it for tonight, it doesn't, I don't really have a cutoff time. So I actually might use my uh, Be Right Back screen to make some coffee. We'll see. It's, like I said, we got some good, uh, good chance of having clear skies right the way through. However, coming up at about, I think about one in the morning, the dew point is going to be reaching its, I guess, uh, its tipping point. We're going to start getting some fogging of the, the mirrors on the camera and the telescope, or the guide scope lens. And that is a bit of a problem because I don't have a dew heater to combat that on my telescope yet because it's such a larger telescope than I've had in the past and you do need to have a proper sized dew heater to like i said to combat that against the uh from the mirrors fogging up so that is one bit of kit that i'll need to save up on and yeah i'll uh have to work towards that but right now for the time up until about like i said about midnight one o'clock it's sh the weather should hold up and we won't have any issues of the the, you know, the glass fogging up at all, so that'll be all right. So before our image is complete, we'll, we'll have a look in Stellarium just to show you what we're where we are, and we're really not too far from the Pac-Man Nebula which was just this spot over here. And the heart is just down this section here and it's paired up to the soul nebula. So a little heart and soul for the evening. And I will, there's a few areas around here that are interesting. So I'm, I'm going to do a few images of this little section anyway, because there is the Let's get a, a view of what we can kind of expect to look at there. Now this red red box around there, that is the sensor size that we're that we're working with. And that's my ASI 533 dedicated astronomy camera, which will it's a square size sensor, and I've gone on, I've banged on about this in the past. Or is very hesitant hesitant on getting this sensor because it's everything is wide widescreen kind of you know that 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 sixteen by nine ratio and uh, or even four by three for for most for some of the cameras but the square sensor kind of threw me off for some reason and it took me a while to actually want us to to. to purchased the camera thinking that is this going to be for me and really ended up being the one and really the square sensor doesn't doesn't impact my photography in the least and I really thought it would but it's it, it works really well for framing up targets and yeah I think it's uh, it makes it just a fun camera for some reason I don't know why it that word fun comes up so much with it but it's been just a pleasure to use this camera. So. Now this, uh, these images are from, these are what is just kind of in the database of Stellarium, the program that I used to kind of plan my, um, my nights. But we have finished the image of the of the heart and let's go over to the ASI Air. So 
wow, you have some amazing tech. That scope is precise. I've been tempted myself to purchase a scope. Well, it, what kind of ideas were you looking for? Like, it really depends on what your goals are going to be. Um, I mean, if you're just looking to observe, you can start off with a pair of binoculars. Um, a lot of the mobile phones, they have the option of you know, taking like 30 second exposures and get a nice real wide field view with those. Um, like I started off with a five inch telescope and that worked out fairly well for me to kind of start off. And eventually it just, you know, my goals became a little more focused on what I wanted to do. And there's been some uh, changes in equipment. And right now at this point, I do feel I'm pretty much at the, the point of where I want to be with things right now. And if I was going to change things up any more drastically, I would be needing to look into different mounts. So there's, yeah, like as long as you have a camera, you have a DSLR and a tripod and shooting the night sky at like 18 millimeters, you can get away with doing maybe 30, 45 seconds of an exposure before you're going to start to see star trails. And depending on where you are, that's going to be enough to start picking up some finer details because obviously light pollution is going to be a factor. Um, obviously, the closer you can kind of get to basically when there is no, when you're at the maximum of astronomical darkness is gonna be more uh, beneficial right now i'm shooting uh during a what's the phase of the moon what did i say 80 some odd percent because the moon is going to impact the night sky 81 percent of a waxing moon so that's going to be a factor but it's uh yeah there's People always ask, what's the right telescope to buy? And unfortunately, the answer is the one you're going to use the most. Um, so I definitely have to get away from the city lights to see the sky. Um, yeah, it depends on kind of where you are. I am in a... The light pollution is measured in the Bortle scale. And it goes... It ranges from one is the darkest... Uh, sky that you can have and nine is basically if you're in the middle of the city and you're only going to see a handful of the brightest stars from there uh, there are ways to combat that there are filters that will cut out most of that light uh, the filter I'm using is cutting out about 90% of the light pollution uh, it can still be impacted a little bit by some glare and that can be mitigated by using a longer dew shield on your telescope. Um, the benefits of the telescope that I'm using have these inner baffles that are supposed to kind of catch any stray light and maybe bounce it back out or just, like I said, just mitigate any of the factors that it, uh, that stray light is gonna cause with your images. So I have processed this image before and I do want to give it a fair shake again because it was about a 15 hour exposure that I had uh, that I started to process. So it's it definitely deserves to have a uh, another go. And I do have it lined up for one of my rainy day astronomies. And basically this is actually my backup image just in case everything goes to pot and I have to try something else. But this image is always on standby because Eventually, it's going to get the proper treatment again. <laughs> so, we'll have a look. This is the uh, kind of the central star forming region in the Heart Nebula. And again, it's one of those images that I see other people take this shot, and it's just this kind of ethereal, underwater looking kind of, depending on the, the palette that you're shooting on. But it's just this amazing tower, it, the way you orient it can uh, impact that, but it's just this incredible area. And let me boost up the the histogram here and get the most contrast out of this. 
and try not to really rip it apart, you know? And I can see that this, this kind of gradient along there, that is the, the moon and the street lights that are impacting on things. Now this also, like I said, is a five minute image and I have increased the gain. Uh, you know, I'm using twice the amount of gain so there is a little more noise to combat. But at the same time, I think that is A really interesting region of the sky and I think if I was actually I could probably even start cooling the camera down a little more because we are we're reaching cooler temperatures tonight and that is the just this kind of swirling I can't change the orientation on here but this kind of tower of gas and dust they're basically being formed by the, the solar winds of these stars that are being formed in the area. I think yeah, def if definitely dropping the, the gain because you can see all this noise that are coming from the camera. That is, I've, that's also there because I've turned up, I'm using you know twice the amount of uh, of gain on there, same thing as increasing the ISO on a camera, so you are also amplifying that noise. Uh, I could probably drop, like I said, drop the temperature and start to eliminate that a little more. And what I might do is in the next section, I could probably go with a try another, try a 10 minute exposure with the lower gain. But that is Malot 15 and really just, just at the bottom of the lower right. Um, I could have framed it up a little differently, but there is like this almost lacy looking shadow of uh, some of the, the dust lanes in that area that are, like I said, just kind of creates like this like lace effect in there. And I think that, uh, again, it, there's so many interesting parts around this nebula that it's great to shoot at wide field. It's doing something at this focal length would be great for doing a big mosaic and really getting a nice detailed image of the area. And I'm gonna save that one down. And like I, said, I kinda, all these little things, like all these peripherals that kind of pop up with uh, trying to do your own, um, doing a channel on here, is kind of setting up a Discord and sharing these images and just kind of leaving them available. And I'm, um, yeah, just trying to get, you know, more than just looking at it on here, just other avenues. I think Instagram is good if I'm kind of sharing a final photo and yeah, it's just, just kind of throwing these images on a uh, server. So is all that software adjustment with the, with the noise or do you need to get another lens? Now that is what this is doing. This is just doing a, I'm just stretching the image on here because you, because as it, You know, with uh, without really stretching it, you can see the noise is a little, a little more muted. And like I said, with astrophotography, you do have to take multiple images over time and build up that image, because there is going to be this noise that kind of comes through, and some areas are going to be much, um, much fainter than others. So you need to just keep building up those images and taking multiple shots. Uh, usually when I'm doing these images, I'm gonna shoot about five minutes and try to get at least four hours total on an image before I really start getting a good
processed image that comes out of them. Some areas that are really, really bright, you can kind of get away with using a little less exposure time because you are, all that the bright areas are kind of really punching through um, any noise pollution, or noise pollution, um, any light pollution that you might have and areas like this can be like the, the core of the heart nebula is nice and bright however like the areas around it are still faint so you do have to take that time to to tease those details out of there and yeah that with some older images uh, i would have to try and find them but using my uh, my dslr you can really see that i was fighting with the noise to get any kind of meaningful signal coming through. And really, unless you're shooting um, shorter exposures, it's the, the noise from the camera kind of means a little less, but conversely, you're still not getting enough signal. So, but there are some people who are, who are really, really super patient and will take the time to do like those 10 second exposures and build them up over hundreds and hundreds of exposures to get a image out of there. However, I think shooting a longer exposure is still gonna net you more signal uh, than anything. But what I'm going to do is move just a little bit to maybe save that there. I'm just going to move up to this area, which is also known as the Fish Head Nebula. There we go. Let's get the uh, the labels up on there, and that is IC seventeen ninety five. Now I'm going to see it kind of lines it up. Let's see. If it, I think it's going to center it like right on there. So what I'm going to do is also show a cool little feature that the ASI Air had added not too long ago. Her screen where we got all of our stuff. So you know what we're looking at here. Like I said, that is IC seventeen ninety five, and that's what I also really like about the go to astronomy tools is that you're not searching through the night sky. And there's a people who, you know, who those who came before us in astrophotography and astronomy, they didn't have computers to guide them throughout the sky. And some of them are really resentful of this kind of automatic go-to system that has been put in place for a lot of these things. However, it's just one of those things that it just makes it that much more easy to enjoy things because I think if you're out there in the freezing cold and you're trying to locate a target and it just isn't coming into view and it gets frustrating and I've had that with I had a different sky tracking mount that was totally manual and the only automatic part about it was that it would follow you know the earth's rotation so you could at least do a longer exposure with that and I was getting a better feel for the night sky, but there were some nights where I was spending more time trying to find my target than I was actually imaging the target. And it could get a little, a little bit of a downer. So yeah, being able to pick out your target and, and then going, you know, going to where, cancel that. Um, where you need to be just kind of takes that 
you know, that, uh, not so much the guesswork, but the frustration out of things, you know? So, so I've moved it. The telescope, you know, it's moved to my new target. And let's, get, let's take a let's wait for that guiding to return. No, that's not a good start. Oh, again. Actually, I don't need to guide at the at this very second. I can do a five second exposure just to double check where we are. Just in case the nebula isn't quite framed up of where I want it to be. Because I don't want it to be sitting too low in the frame. And it's not too bad. I think probably want it to center on that star. So if you do a with the ASI Air is a, a, a hold a long press on the screen, this little option will pop up, and you click on that, and the and it'll center on that on that section that you want. So if you're so if the target like this one is kind of its cardinal point is a little off on where the nebula actually is that's where it, f it kind of focuses on but more of it might be you know kind of out of frame so yeah just that little little um, addition there to do that fine tuning is a cool little feature that was added a few months back and I think it's been fairly invaluable for kind of centering up the target instead of with an old hand controller you're still just hitting up down left and right to try and move your target to where you want to go and sometimes the you know, mount can jump a little bit and then you lose your target and you kind of got to start all over and at least this way it knows where it is and that what I did just there that's the plate solving and what it does it looks at this image that's been taken and it knows, now it knows exactly where the mount is pointing, uh, what target we're on. So if I'm gonna go anywhere else, it already knows exactly how far it should go to reach that other target. So I think this one, this area is a little brighter as well, uh, overall I think. So you can almost see it in just a five second exposure. And that's another beautiful thing about these astronomy dedicated cameras is that they just have a higher sensitivity than a regular DSLR does. And just able to see um, more of your target in a shorter amount of time. And again, it just works out with uh, being able to frame up your, your targets there. So with this one, what I'm going to do is I will be able to ramble on a bit more for this area of the sky and we're going to drop that gain down to 100. And we are at minus 10. And I don't think the cooler, yeah, the cooler's working at 30%. We're at, I think about eight degrees right now. No, eight or nine degrees, eight degrees. So the cooler isn't working that hard to get to sub-zero temperatures. So do you ever catch meteorites passing by while the camera's taking your image? Yes, I have had that happen on occasion. Uh, it's more common uh, doing wide field shots and especially when there is a outburst of meteors and we are pretty much at the kind of the peak area of the Orionid meteor shower right now. So if you are looking to the southeast in the kind of early hours in the morning when Orion is kind of in the sky, there's a good chance you're gonna see some meteors um, emanating from that kind of point in the sky. And yeah, catching a meteor in these images is a welcome sight as opposed to 
having a satellite or an airplane blow through your shot and ruining it. Um, Yeah, there's much is this this yeah, meteors are much more <laughs> they're more um they're more welcome in the shot than anything else because just the depending on your focal length uh catching those can be a rare sight. There was um one of the other uh streamers on Twitch Econ Greg, he does uh, very similar to what I do. Um, and he has a couple more telescopes kind of set up and he'll do some daytime astronomy. But he caught a beautiful meteorite while shooting the Rosette Nebula the other day. And it was nice and bright and green. And just the colors that you're gonna see from what's left over from the meteorite, you can kind of tell the chemical composition of what blew through the atmosphere. And I'm not, qualified on how to identify what the exact colors mean but it's really cool to see those and it was a nice bright one that he caught and i'll see if i can find a previous image uh, i did catch one when i was shooting the california nebula last season and yeah that was uh just one of those shots that i'm like yeah totally fine with having that happen catching that was uh is always fun and at this focal length that I'm shooting at at 979 millimeters I haven't caught a meteorite yet and I think because that's just such a like I'll show you in Stellarium so we are all right we're imaging on the fish head nebula right now but in Stellarium The, like I said, that this little red box is my focal length and camera sensor. It is a very, very specific area of the night sky that I'm catching right now. So. Now, if I was to be, let's see if I can have a, right now, if I was shooting with my DSLR at 18 millimeters, this, everything in that red box would be what I'd be capturing. So on that, on that scale, got a better chance of capturing a meteor kind of coming through and so it's a much wider field of view with the camera, whereas, you know, if I, you know, going back to here's my focal length now, so it's much more, for, at, at this length you're getting, I'm going for the details and with wide field, with my other telescope that um, once once Orion comes around, I think I'm going to switch up telescopes um, every few nights just to be able to get some more shots because with my, this is the other one, I'd be able to catch with my Skywatcher 72ED, this one I'll be able to capture the whole nebula. And somewhere, somewhere among all my files, I do have a few wide field shots of the Heart Nebula, so I'll I do need to find those and process that a little bit so we can get a comparison of that versus the centering right on the heart nebula. So yeah, definitely being able to, I've, so at this focal length um, with this camera, like there's, you see there's a little, it's a little wider and I have captured meteors at this focal length, which is, um, it can be pretty rare as well because you're still fairly tight on things.
but even well, I do have a reducer on this telescope as well which is actually making the focal length a little uh, wider because without it this little that's about as tight as it goes at its native focal length at about 1600 millimeters but the um, trade-off with that is it captures a light that much slower so I would definitely need to do much longer exposures because the focal ratio isn't as efficient of capturing the of processing the light as quickly as moving it down to um, this at uh, this focal length which basically almost drops everything in half so when you are using a longer focal length and you do have that, sh that, uh, that a slower focal ratio that kind of works better with your imaging planets and speaking of planets I do wonder if Mars is still available because that's uh, another section that I like to look at because we are Ooh, it might be I'll check the security camera and see let's see while we're waiting for we got another another four minutes on the fish head nebula yeah which everything looks good right now guiding is nice so let's have a look doesn't want to do its transition now I think Mars is going to be behind those trees to the right there which is unfortunate yeah that's all right uh, I do some previous videos with uh, with Mars shot in there. So does that cloud of dust and gas always change shape, or does it stay the same? Hey, you notice that it changes. On uh, for our astronomical distances, we're not going to see much change in the way how these nebulas are, um, pretty much at all. It's there's some areas uh, like the Crab Nebula, which people have recorded. You can see the waves from the pulsar that's in the middle of it. You can kind of see some movement in there, but it, because these are such vast distances, and unless things are kind of really close to us, we're not going to see a lot of movement because you know the speed of light. Being at about 299 million uh, meters per second is it's still astronomically slow like you know the sun the light that's coming from the sun takes eight minutes to get to us the light that's going from when we see um, Mars that's about on average about eight minutes away or something um, 13 minutes away and Jupiter um, Saturn is that much that much more uh, like you know our nearest star is four light years away so everything that we're seeing out there is in the past so there have been some some supernovas um, or not sorry some planetary nebula that have been uh, seen I think that it's uh, I think V838 Monoceratus is one that we can see that we that's been recorded uh, its movement and yeah but generally uh, for the most part everything that we're looking at is going to be staying about the same the laptops just making a noise uh, 
So yeah, there's uh, we can you can notice the stars. You can notice their parallax movement, which would be when we're on one side of the sun and as we kind of come around in orbit on the other side. And if you observe that star again, the background will kind of shift ever so slightly depending on how uh, close or how far away that star is. But other than other than that, yeah, we don't see a whole lot of movement that goes along. Uh, there are the, around Cygnus X1, which unfortunately that area is kind of obscured by trees for me. There have been people have kind of caught like the kind of this wave from the black hole, this like gravitational wave in that area where you can kind of see a bit of movement and there's other areas in the Orion Nebula. Maybe we'll, we'll see if it, I don't know if I can capture it because, well, I, my telescope is a mini Hubble telescope. It's not the Hubble telescope. So there have, you can see like the, the bow shock from stars. And that's like the, the stellar winds that's kind of blowing away the gas and dust. And basically the way how, the same way as when a, a boat is traveling on the water, you can see that wake in front of it as it's meeting up with the water and just kind of pushing that out there. The same idea for a bow shock where all that stellar radiation is pushing against the intergalactic medium and it just creates that wave. And um, so yeah, there's bow shock or the, uh, the termination shock where a, the best way you can kind of see that is if you're, you turn their faucet on in the sink and you can see where the water is going down and the water is pushing out, but what's going back that area around the water that's being pushed up, being pushed back in, that's the termination shock. And that's kind of the, the same way ish as the radiate, the stellar radiation works pushing against the, the interstellar medium. So to kind of get a rough idea, a very simplified version of what is kind of going on out in space is yeah just turn on your your faucet and just see how the water goes pushes against the the bottom of the sink and the water kind of rushing back against it you learn so hope <laughs> if i can teach anybody one little thing each day i am my you know, that's that's my mission accomplished and i feel good for that and i appreciate uh, to be able to tell you something new and i'm like i'm always doing what i can to learn any little tidbits about astronomy and there's always new things uh, even today there was news released that they have found water on the moon on the sunlit side of the moon and that's basically kind of almost wet soil around there now this is very very early news that has just broke the papers have just been released today so much like how things were with uh, potential life on Venus, it's going to be highly scrutinized right now. So I uh, will hold my breath on things and just kind of reserve any excitement on that right now. But that was part of the uh, SOFIA mission. And I think that was the solar ob observation or for infrared astronomy. I believe that acronym. Um, they're kind of getting better at acronyms, but they're some of them can be a little a little forced. But yeah, that's the uh, that is the new space news, the biggest news today, uh, of them finding basically water on the sunlit side of the moon. Now our image. is complete. And I'm liking that one. Definitely frame that up. It's cheese and a little bit of dirt and a tiny bit of water. <laughs> 
sorry, I'm actually just staring at this image because I didn't really shot this area before. I was kind of taking it in at the moment. Um, so this is the kind of the top of the heart nebula and the known as the fish head nebula. And this this shot right out of the camera without any processing right now, processing is incredible. And these are just some of those areas of the sky where sometimes it turns out kind of meh, all right. And there's other times when I don't know why exactly some areas just turn out way better than the others and it could just be uh, I think we're actually shooting almost straight up now into the zenith so there's less atmosphere to combat with so like when you see stars twinkling that's kind of poor seeing in our sky and there's just a lot of same way seeing a mirage on the street during a hot day and it's just that atmospheric disturbance. But when things are nice and calm and still and... I think guiding is really good as well because those stars are still pretty darn round. I mean, I'll be a pixel peeper and just say that there is maybe a little, little tiny bit of elongation in those stars. But... Yeah, I'm going to... The guiding was spot on. So I'm definitely very happy with that image. And yeah, if you, I guess if you tilt your head one way or the other, you can definitely see how you got like the, the gills around there and it's kind of... It's really an amazing shot. Thank you. Um, this is, yeah, this is this, the beauty of a, a camera that is designed to shoot outer space. It's, uh, you're cooled to sub-zero temperatures. The filter I'm using is, a, it's designed to cut out, like I said, basically 99% of all the light pollution and most of the visible spectrum uh, entirely. So I'm just left with the, all the red that we're seeing is basically gonna be the hydrogen alpha gases in that area. And if I were to be able to kind of split this up into three, into the red, green, and blue spectrum, you'd see more detail in this red and probably from this area, very little in the green and blue channel because this isn't, kind of high in oxygen three. So it's um, hydrogen beta is kind of, it's, there's less of that in astro images, but the way how this filter is uh, created is it, that part is mainly captured in the blue channel, which will add a little more, just a little more data into your image overall. Uh, whereas there's other, um, filters now that are just basically capturing two very narrow bands of the spectrum and basically you're only looking at the red and the green channel really picking up a lot of that light because in uh, the terrestrial cameras and even in the astronomy uh, one-shot color cameras you still have that red green green blue color matrix where the the sensor is going to process that light and yeah because it does have more green because most of the time with the cameras you it's going to pick there's more green in the you know on earth than there is anywhere else so the cameras are just designed to pick up that uh, those wavelengths a little better so let me let's do a let's stretch that a little bit and bring out some more details and you see that a little bit of those street lights and moon are still kind of creating that, that gradient. But at about one in the morning, which is nice, the street lights all go out in the in the area. So that kind of puts a little less strain on the, the camera and the filter. And then that uh, that kind of lighter 
area in the top right goes away. And it can also, when for taking um, taking subframes, which will, um, yeah, these are your main light frames that you take with uh, your pictures. You also need to take a series of images with basically the lens cap on and that gets rid of the noise, the, just the regular noise that kind of happens in the camera. And then you're gonna shoot some more uh, images with the lens cap on again, but at the fastest shutter speed, and that kind of gets rid of any like vignetting around there. And again, that deals with a little bit more of the, um, just any noise that can come from the sensor. And then you're gonna shoot your flats where you're basically keeping a a flat white screen. Uh, sometimes put a t-shirt and just shoot at an evenly lit area and that kind of gets rid of any of the bits of dust that are on, that's on your camera lens, uh, any bits of dust or hairs that might be on the telescope lens or the mirror somewhere. Also kind of dealing with any of the gradients that you uh, that you get from from your light sources. So yeah, there's lots, lot, a lot that, you, that needs to go into making a smooth, clean astro image. Uh, again, also your environment, your environmental factors like your street lights, uh, the moon is uh, always come into play there. But yeah, being able to, again, choosing that, uh, that, um, the go going to that specific star to center on that new area is better because really it was going to be you know if it was framed up it would have been centered kind of there we would have lost out all this all the rest of the area around there but i think definitely with more more integration time on this these areas uh you can't see my mouse pointing on there the areas to the left and it's just like those almost sharp jagged looking images are um, those bits of I guess those little wispy bits of dust that are covering up things would look really interesting for sure but let's make sure to save that one down see we are yeah like I said we're almost like pointing straight up here which is good for being able to um, to combat the any of the atmosphere now what did I see I did sneak a peek at a yeah there's a galaxy in this area that we're gonna give we're gonna give that a go because well it, it's better to shoot galaxies with a broadband filter where you're capturing more light but it does look like in this section there could be some um, nebulae within this galaxy that you can that you can see so let's give that a go because why not right that is I see three four two and it's not not too far from here so it doesn't take long to to slew over there and this will kind of this galaxy will fill most of the center of the of the frame so that's that's gonna be kind of cool let's see how that turns out now I have I've shot like Andromeda and the Triangulum Galaxy with the filter with this filter on there and you do you do lose some of the, the the details of like the stars almost in that area but it also makes that the like like what we're looking at right now with the fish head nebula is any nebulae in that galaxy kind of really starts to stand out when you're shooting with the narrowband filters so hopefully we uh we can see see some of that there. Let's see. Uh, 
let's go back to back to there make sure the scope is moving to where it has to and centered. And let's see. Yeah, uh, from my reference, shot that kind of line of stars right in the middle. Basically goes right through the, what would be the core of the galaxy. So, yeah, we're good to start. Let's see. Uh, do a plate solve on that just kind of make sure I do I, you pr I probably don't have to do a plate solve on like every image however I have had times in the past where I've I've shot an image and all of a sudden after I've went to pick a new target the amount is pointed in a wildly new direction and that's definitely not what I want <laughs> um, so I think just this quick little little um, uh, confirmation of where we are is yeah that's just going to be able to give me a little peace of mind that make sure the mount make sure the computer on there knows what we're looking at and where we are so I see what little bit of information actually there's a fair bit there So this actually, this galaxy isn't too far away from us. We're only, it's, uh, was that seven, seven million light years away. And Andromeda, which is our closest at about two and a half million light years away is, uh, yeah, it's, it's still gonna be much, Andromeda is gonna be much larger in the sky. So this galaxy is, um, See when it says what the size, excuse me, of the galaxy is, because we are about twenty-five thousand light years away from our galactic center, and how wide is the Milky Way? I still don't have that memorized. I have to check on that. Yeah, so there's, uh, yeah, they figured this is about 7 million, this galaxy would be about 7 million light years away. And I just want to know if it is part of our local group because the Andromeda galaxy and the Triangulum galaxy, which are kind of part of our um, group of galaxies that are kind of gravitationally bound, are those three, are, you know, are, are our three galaxies are going to combine at some point in the next uh, few billion years and form a new galaxy then whether or not this one is uh, gravitationally bound as well i have to maybe look into that a little more but we'll see how this image kind of turns out and like i said with uh, shooting galaxies in narrow band you really would use this data as a luminance layer where you would uh, kind of use these colors to make the like the nebulae in the in the galaxy shot really stand out because you're going to want to shoot galaxies in broadband uh, or at least if you're shooting monochrome definitely do red green and blue to get as much of the spectrum out of them as possible and then using your hydrogen alpha filter to let's say make those nebulae really pop in the image in the end there so i would treat this one like i said as as your luminance layer and that kind of help that'll help your contrast as well your once you've finished editing your final astro image so we'll have a look 
in Stellarium just to see uh, where the galaxy is. Like I said, it's not too far. We've been really tight in this area of, of uh, Cassiopeia. So I will kind of move around in the sky a little more, but there's just so much in this section that, uh, that we have to look at. And really, like I said, I probably got maybe even another two hours before I really pack it in and we'll uh, maybe start to see the, the dew kind of forming on things. And yeah, like I said, well, it looks like at about uh, one o'clock, it really starts, the dew point is gonna reach um, seven degrees and that's gonna start to form uh, condensation on everything. But like I said, I'll uh, be working towards the next purchase for all this kit will be a series of dew, dew heaters and dew bands for, uh, for all the, the scopes that I'll be using that way. I'm not gonna be, be able to image throughout the entire night and I'm not gonna have to worry about the dew forming on the, on the lenses and on the mirrors. So yeah, once the, uh, once the imaging night is done, everything will kind of automatically, well, it's programmed to shut off and kind of park itself back in the home position, turns everything off and, you know, you clean it up, cover it all up in the morning. But for now, I will kind of just keep an eye on things. All right. Good night, Ma. Enjoy your dinner. Thanks for coming by. Appreciate you guys uh, sticking around. So yeah, I will, uh, we've got another four minutes on this image. And yeah, so let's jump up into Stellarium. Oops, sorry, let's uh, see if I can find it just by. That's one where I see. I thought it was IC three four three three four two. Yeah, that's it. That is our target. Interesting, it doesn't show up as uh, an entire galaxy in this. Now some of the images in Stellarium, such as this galaxy for example, aren't as detailed and I do wonder, maybe just updates. Um, I think actually, no, you can, I think it is Stellarium or maybe in one of the other kind of uh, programs, you can actually throw your own images in there. Hmm. I'm gonna have to look at that. Night boy, enjoyed. Thanks pops, thanks old balls. Appreciate you guys stopping in. So, yeah, I think on uh, in Stellarium, I'm not sure. I think it, it, I'm gonna I'm gonna look into this because if I can start adding some of my own images into the database, you can just kind of get a better idea of what you're looking at, and that'll kind of help pick targets out for the for the night. Because really, this tiny little little red circle, the red oval in there, those in Stellarium denote a galaxy. But that little oval doesn't do justice because this, where you can see this straight line of stars running through and this one star that almost looks like a seven on the, in the right there, the galaxy covers all of that and a, and a fair bit more around there. So yeah, definitely it's not a, it's not a tiny, not a tiny target. Um, let's see if there's any other information I have on 
and here. Now it's fairly, could be fairly dim, but again, at seven million light years away, it can probably be good enough to um, to see see some detail in there. And in just under a minute and a half, we'll see how this image turns out. And like I said, we're still kind of in the area of close to Cassiopeia. Actually, now we are in Dallas. All right. I have never pronounced that one before, and I probably butchered it. Camelopardalis. Go with that. All right, let's go back to the ASI Air because we have coming up on ten five seconds left on that there. Uh, ooh, star lost. Where are we at? What's going on out there? All right. Uh, sorry about this. Let me. Have a quick, a quick peek outside there. Because you now we can see. happening out there well the exposure has finished it looks like I wonder if it might even just be the angle at which the the moon is kind of hitting the sky in the area that I'm looking at because it doesn't look doesn't look too bad out there we're still seeing stars continue guiding but I don't need to guide anymore on this point right back to our galaxy and it definitely is a very dim that is very dim that would definitely need a lot of integration time on there I mean, I don't know how well it's going to be uh, showing up on your on your screens there, but you can start to. I mean, the stars are nice and round, and that little that blotch in the middle that we're looking at—that's the core of the of the galaxy. So it's being illuminated on all points there. So let me let's let's zoom back out and do a little histogram stretch. Let's bring this brightness up a boatload. Let's get, oh, I'm probably gonna have to get fairly aggressive on this to maybe start seeing some details. There we go. Now we're starting to see a little more of the spiral structure. Just find that, try to get a little balance in there. Yeah, so we can start to 
you start to see a little more of that spiral structure of the galaxy coming through there. That's a, a, a that is fairly dim. So you definitely need to be doing uh, broadband imaging on that. But a lot, I think a lot of the spiral that we're seeing in there, um, excellent. Okay, cool. That, great. You can see that too. Uh, a lot of that is pretty much going to be the nebula, the nebulae in that area. So I have to do maybe a little more research on this galaxy, but maybe it, it, it could be uh, higher in star forming regions than, than our galaxy. We don't know. Um, I, have to, I have to look into that a little more. But yeah, you can definitely start to see those spiral arms coming out there. It's, um, yeah, and even in the top left corner, that is, I gotta say that that's gotta be another galaxy altogether. And yeah, that's an entirely different galaxy which is 73 million light years from us. So yeah, so 10 times farther than what we're looking at right now. But that, yeah, that, that in the corner, in the left corner, that is an entire galaxy of that tiny little smudge. depending on now just just out of frame just above that other uh, tiny galaxy was another galaxy so like yeah like literally just above that little tiny triangle of stars up there would have been another galaxy in the shot yeah, let's see if I can Bring it like basically right up to the peak of the histogram there, which is this is kind of getting overly aggressive on on the image. However, still being able to see that spiral structure throughout all the the noise and things. Yeah. Okay. Let me. I'm gonna back down on that just a little bit. And uh, yeah, it's a tough one to see. Galaxies, like I say, can be tough when you're shooting narrow band. And I think, uh, yeah, I could I'd pop the other filter in, but things, not so much things go wrong, but I have to refocus the telescope again and again that also doesn't take very long to do um, but I, like I said I, I want to try to get as much find as much as many targets in the sky as possible and let's see let's uh, what we got we have Where there was, where's the one thing I was looking at? It should be available. It's a kind of a part reflection, part emission nebula. In uh, say in the constellation of Perseus, which is kind of kind of see if I make sure I'm not passing up anything in this kind of general area. Yeah, 
yeah let's uh let's jump down to perseus and There's a, there's a tiny planetary nebula on the way by. That's uh, kind of close by to where everybody's really, it's a small one. I'd almost want to shoot that one at the native focal length. So I will jump down to Perseus and we'll be kind of near the Pleiades and the California Nebula. And maybe just kind of get a little bit of Taurus I think there's more reflection. Getting a reflection nebula is on, on par with shooting a galaxy because you're going to want to be able to see uh, with the reflection nebula. Sorry, it's the the stars are just literally reflecting off of um, some dust that's in the area. You're not really catching any gases being emitted from um, or any of the, the particles that are being excited by the stellar radiation. So, yeah, shooting, yeah, shooting emission, emission nebulas are the, are what's better for this, this filter. But this is a kind of, this is like a bit of a, a double whammy with emission and uh, reflection in there. So, that'd be a target that you would use two sets of filters on. And again, if you had more free and clear nights then yeah i would definitely well let's uh i gotta take a look at it i've never shot this one before i have kind of captured it in wide field and i think it might be called the embryo nebula uh colloquially because it looks like uh um, like a like a chicken embryo when you're kind of looking at it through a, a light through the egg we'll take a look at that we'll see how that uh how that goes This, uh, yeah, this is sitting well above the houses, above the roof line there, so we'll definitely be able to see that. And it's already at the, we're at the target, just making sure we are on target. For those of you who have just popped in, thank you very much. I am Tom, I am the Astro Canuck, and we are taking live images of outer space. And this is all done with the telescope that you're looking at right now. And my astronomy dedicated camera attached to this whole rig. It's making this possible. And I'm controlling it with a Raspberry Pi controlled computer, the ASI Air, that's uh, running this whole rig, telling it, the telescope uh, where to go, where to point, how long to shoot the camera for. And let's see. It is taking its sweet time on the target. And yeah, controlling it all through the ASI air. Let's see. Just making sure that we are on target here. didn't want to let me know where it was. Let's make sure we are where we need to be. It looks like we might be Well, 
like I said, there might have been a chance of kind of a little bit of thin clouds rolling through. But let's uh, let's pick a brighter star out of this kind of group. It does look that little bit of wispy gray around there. It does look like there might be some clouds rolling through at the moment. Uh, the um, the ASI Air, it's its own little Raspberry Pi computer. Uh, I'm running Windows, and it'll work with um, iPhone, Android. Um, I don't know about Linux. I think it, I think it will. I have to double check on that. But um, yeah, the whole point of the computer is. Uh, Actually, let me pan the camera down a bit there. Let's get back to guiding. So yeah, on the... So on the, the telescope mount, just this, li this little box here, that's the ASI Air. Raspberry Pi computer, which controls everything there. Dusty, how's it going, man? Good to see you here. And yeah, we've been, uh, yeah, been not shooting images for the past almost two hours now, and things have been going fairly well. And right now, I'm just uh, I've picked a new target, and we'll see how that goes. Um, it's kind of a Bit of a double whammy of a reflection nebula and an emission nebula and yeah just talking about the uh, bit of the setup at the moment so that's my asi air raspberry pi controlled computer and yeah i had to this is an extra peer extension because i wouldn't have at the as I, the legs are almost fully extended on the the tripod as well and i'd really like to be able to keep things as low to the ground as possible and just keep everything stable but just the my line of sight out of my back garden isn't the isn't the best so i do have to lift things up quite a bit and i gotta tell you putting this telescope on there the very first night i got it i kind of i underestimated the weight of this uh of the scope it's it's one of the biggest ones that i've used uh, I have used a smaller five inch um, SCT telescope and that weighed like maybe a, a kilo or you know two kilos um, and my refractor telescope weighs about the same so when this one comes out of the box at about uh, was it 12 Oh, 15 oh god yeah like I think it was, it's about like 15 kilos so it's definitely uh, reaching up that high like the the rig itself is my height at about six one and then adding the extra height to get the telescope on top of there was a bit of a, a, a bit of an a, of an excursion so that was uh, yeah, a kind of tense moment trying to get it up there and think it's everything in place. Can I let it go? So, yeah, that was uh, that was an interesting first night, which I'm glad wasn't filmed. Um, but yeah, that's uh, this is basically the the whole rig that I'm using right now. Let's get the let's get more of the night sky up there. the smallest steps that I can do on the security camera there. Yeah, it's deceptively, it, while it is still a, this model, because you say 15 kilograms is heavy, yeah. Um, it's, while it is the carbon fiber tube model, which uh, I did get this one used, so it's new to me, but it was previously enjoyed by someone else. And 
it's not it's still not very light if anything this, this just kind of helps with um, keeping the overall tube uh, cooler uh, just a fraction of a little a little bit lighter there I think the other the other version is about maybe 18 kilos but yeah lifting it up I'm basically lift, it, the, the height is going to be up just above my shoulders that I'm getting on there and all the weight is in the back by the mirror the yeah the front of the the tube is overall has like no weight um, yeah everything is kind of centered is central to the the back area there So let's, uh, yeah, sorry, I've been having an issue with the, the scope, but it just didn't want to finish its detection of the area. Didn't want to finish plate solving. So let's just kind of make sure we're in the right spot. that it doesn't want to solve maybe there is some clouds rolling through that are uh, obscuring let's do let's do 10 seconds bring some some more detail out of there usually it'll it'll still kind of pick out where we are and really that's normal to be getting gremlins because I'm trying to do this live <laughs> all right there should be some more stars there So being where you are, carbon fiber is the way to go for sure. Temperature fluctuations, yeah. It. Um, what about we're kind of we've been fairly stable for the last little while. Um, but yeah, I think in the, the summertime, it would make a big difference. Now, why doesn't it want to plate solve? I do believe though that I am in the right area anyway. That uh, everything looks to be where it should be. Let's go a little longer. Let's bump it up to 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. Now, like I said, things things like to go wrong when people are, are looking. <laughs> um, everything else has been working just fine. I don't know if it's just the the target, but uh, we'll see how that. Uh, I think I really think it's it's all in the right spot there because everything else has been pretty much bang on target where I want it to go. And I did plate solve just before I had left from this area, so. Everything your scope should know where it is, and yeah, I think that you know what. Let's well, let's do the the shot anyway. All right, that seems to be good. And there we go, running on. A 10 minute image which should be NGC 1333 which is just a little kind of lies just a little right between the California Nebula and the Pleiades so we'll see how this one turns out and if it kind of goes to pot we have a few other targets in the area that we can have a look at uh, definitely won't be able to get all of the Pleiades in one shot because I am at about 979, 980 millimeters, and the sensor kind of limits what I can see. So we'll have a quick jump into Stellarium. Let's see if we can get a good idea of where we are. Yeah, 
And yeah, we got coming up will be, <clears throat> looks like we'll, the Flaming Star Nebula and a couple other targets in that area should be available in about an hour or so. And really, I kind of hope to, I'm gonna try this to go as long as I can before before I figure I gotta go to bed for, you know, sleep. So yeah, the Embryo Nebula, that is our target and hopefully it's gonna look close to something as nice as this because it's gonna be interesting because like I said, it is a bit of an emission and a reflection nebula. So probably get more get more of that uh, any of the hydrogen alpha in that section than anything um, I think the, the blues of like oh, the, the star reflection isn't going to be something that we really capture with a narrow band filter because I'm shooting with the Altair Astro tri-band one shot color filter and that's just kind of letting through the hydrogen alpha oxygen 3 and hydrogen beta through the through to the sensor on the camera and yeah I do have some comparisons on my Instagram channel that's Astro Canuck of shooting a target with a narrowband filter and with a broadband filter uh, the broadband filter being just a regular light pollution filter so just kind of cutting out the main sources of light pollution and just leaving every other bit of light that we want to capture from from the universe and it's going to hit the sensor so you can just kind of see the benefit of using one or the other there and pretty much kind of as we approach you know when we get back into into galaxy season i'll swap out the the filter and primarily use a broadband filter which right now is in i've converted an astronomic CLS XT clip filter and I bought an adapter which basically will turn that into a two inch filter that I can add into into my imaging train yeah that'll be uh, so that image you like Mojo Jojo that'll be hopefully Slightly indicative of what we capture in the next uh, five minutes here. Like I said, I think more of the the reds is what uh, we'll see. Hopefully, like I've never I've never shot this uh, this target at uh, this focal length, even for this amount of time. I have briefly caught it in a wide field image of my um, California Nebula and the Pleiades. And, but it wasn't, wasn't completely, it wasn't the, the, the focus of anything. So it was near the edge of the, of the shot. So it didn't get, uh, yeah, it, would, it would have suffered from the vignetting as well. So we'll see how that kind of turns out. Now for those of you who have jumped in, we are taking live images of space. This is an image from a program called Stellarium, which kind of lets you know where you're looking in the night sky. It gives you an idea of what targets are available. And for those of you watching on Facebook, I apologize that I'm not watching the chat on that section because whenever I've opened Facebook, things start going a little haywire on my system. So if you want to join in the conversation, hop on over to Twitch. That's twitch.tv slash astrocanuck and either you know, make yourself a quick account, make a clever screen name and join in or I will kind of follow up with any questions that might have popped up on Facebook just in case anybody is uh, watching over there. And I am simulcasting to Facebook because I paid the $19 to try out Restream with a fancy $10 credit and give it a go, see how well that works out. Um, but my overall plan for a lot of these um, kind of broadcasts will be primarily using Twitch 
as my kind of on the slight plans for imaging or maybe for because planning for a clear for a clear night there have been more more instances where I've said hey it's gonna be clear come on out and let's do some astrophotography and all the clouds roll in after maybe one shot or even just before I start to go live things change pretty quickly for the weather and that's a little unfortunate so I can only plan you know like a day or two in advance if everything looks consistently favorable and this this evening was kind of looking a little a little sketchy because it would it it did um, keep flip-flopping between fairly cloudy not cloudy fairly cloudy um, and tomorrow night is supposed to be clear at about nine o'clock uh, Greenwich Mean Time but not before it chucks it down with rain right up until eight o'clock so we'll see how that goes if it is clear again tomorrow night like I said I'm gonna try to keep doing this as many times as possible whenever the sky is clear and sometimes I can have like I said I'll have some a few days notice and I'll pop up a notification other times things just might happen and that's the what will be advantageous of following and letting anybody else know who's interested in astronomy give me a follow because I'll you know like I said I'll go live at a moment's notice and I want to share any images of the night sky and what I do hope to be able to do in the future is to kind of get more of a, um, I guess, a database um, of people to follow so they can kind of anticipate what targets I have available and maybe even just kind of suggesting any targets that you might want to see kind of come in live because it is a little different than watching or looking at an image in a magazine or kind of you know, looking at someone's Instagram or you know someone's Twitter feed with an image that has been processed um, to bring out the, the most as much detail as possible. Whereas something like this, this is you know we're taking the time to choose our target. We're talking about uh, what the target is. We're anticipating what we're going to see. Maybe it might be something good. It might it might end up being total pants. We don't know. Uh, there are some targets that I know are definite um, definite winners to look at and again sometimes just depending on the on the sky conditions can even impact how those targets turn out because if they're a little low in the sky then you're gonna be I'm gonna be dealing with shooting through any of the atmosphere shooting through any light pollution uh, despite having you know a, a narrow band filter there could still be uh, if I'm shooting too close to the moon that can have a bit of an impact with any glare so yeah there's a lot of targets that are going to be um, the, the, the more reliable targets and something like this that we're shooting right now the embryo nebula it uh, you know we'll find out in the next 20 seconds how it's going to turn out so while we're let's bring up the ASIR and see that come in in the next five seconds like I said maybe something good maybe something crummy maybe something crummy <laughs> detail that we can see in there did it totally miss did we just waste 10 minutes well I can't see anything I think for some reason if the plate solving failed I can't even tell where we are it 
eh, and these are the things that happen. You know, technology can only be so reliable on things. It looks like we didn't capture anything in there. And I'm probably going to, let's see, let's, okay. Now this is 10 minutes. Let's plate solve this and will it find out where we're at? Failed. Okay. That's fine. Let's go let's see. Is, I might start mucking things about here, so. like okay it knows the focal length why is it not detecting this area obviously these kind of things happen all right let's cancel that let's let me have a quick move over to the California Nebula, which is NGC 1499. Just see if it, I don't know if it could, something about the area. Now this might also lead to me having to take a quick scoot outside. So if I do suddenly bolt, it is because the telescope isn't acting in the way it should. So I'm just gonna keep an eye on this. So, one second, just in case things don't go to plan. All right, seems to be working. Solving target is centered. Okay, so there's something about the area that I was just on, which is funny. All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. So let's uh, let's try this again. I'm gonna try. I'm gonna go back to the embryo nebula because if this is all working, all right. Let's plate solve on this again. Are we? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So that was that's how it should go. I should hit the button and boom, it is solved with plate. It is correct with plate solving. So let's sync sync them out. We are very close to the Embryo Nebula. Let me try that again because I don't want to, I want to try a new target. I want to make sure that even if I shoot the same, the same targets every night that I add at least one or two new shots in here that, uh, that either that I've never seen or that are, is more of a said a rare a rare target okay now searching that oh, I hit cancel I didn't hit choose I'm sorry 1533 not found M why was I on Messier hit NGC There we go. Okay, let me try this one more time. Let's choose that. I got a plate solve. We have plate solved, so it knows exactly where it is. We're gonna sync and go to 
the Embryo Nebula. Now, the pros and cons about doing remote astronomy. Hey, Savvy. Things are going well tonight, except for this part that you may have just come in on when there's a bit of an issue with the, um, with the mount and almost more specifically, the target that I'm trying to shoot, which is uh, not cooperating with the system, uh, which is kind of weird. So other than that, it's been going great so far. The skies have remained clear. It was supposed to be cloudy a little bit, but I figured I'd soldier on through that and it's going pretty well. So hopefully your night is going well and hopefully you finally uh, conquered the, some of those areas in Fall Guys from last night. And uh, yeah, it's a, Fall Guys is a game that I, I keep flip-flopping back and forth if I want to get it. I think uh, Phasmophobia got my money first and I think that one is, uh, yeah, it's, um, yeah, Fall Guys, I'll, I'll think about a little more, but um, yeah, I, it looks fun. Um, Phasmophobia is fun, which I'll probably, uh, if tomorrow ends up being crummy weather, I'll still stick to the Twitch schedule of doing some Phasmophobia tomorrow night. Uh, but again, if it's gonna be clear, then I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to scratch video games in favor of what this is all about it is more astronomy. Uh, are you getting light from the camera in there? Uh, how do you mean light from from outside or just light in general? Because I was able to look at the California Nebula, but for some reason looking at this target is causing issues. Uh, it's only 15, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, 15 pounds for, uh, for Fall Guys. Seems totally, totally reasonable. Um, but I figured it's, I'm gonna to try to, to limit limit my purchases at the moment because I do kind of weigh any purchase against the cost of some new telescope equipment, and but that's just uh, that's just me. something gone wrong altogether right so okay going back to the California Nebula because I want to catch up on things. Uh, the IR from the camera facing the scope had the same thing happen a few weeks ago and it ended up being the red light on my security cameras facing the scope. Interesting. Um, I don't think so. I don't think anything's in there. Okay, why now why am I dropping frames? I don't think I have that much going on. Yeah, 
Your astronomy is the main main thing, so don't worry about the games. Yeah, it's um, yeah. I just kind of figured the the video games are a bit of a sidestep, just to if I'm not really stuck for content on astronomy to do, but just to change things up a little bit. But yeah, I think we'll see how things go after Halloween in terms of Phasmophobia's longevity. And, but once, usually once winter kind of rolls around, uh, I've generally noticed that the skies can be a little, um, a little clearer. So hopefully that's gonna start up as soon as it can and just keep some clear, calm skies throughout. All right, so let's find out where we are. Take a shot. And we'll just find out where the scope is sitting in the sky. Now it looks like we're kind of back to where we were for what should have been the embryo nebula. Again, I'm wondering about these supposed dropped frames. Makes me wonder about things. Like, I think at one point I have things kind of figured out in OBS and everything is running all right, and then all of a sudden it just... something changes. And I really haven't been changing... I haven't changed anything since I had the settings I thought were working, but hey, we'll, we'll look into that and find out what's what maybe it's just the way the wind is blowing <laughs> you know just all sorts of weird things all right all right it knows where we are now we are plate solved am i near where i want to be I want to say maybe okay. I'm gonna do another 30 second exposure, and maybe if it if I don't see anything that's gonna look like where I want to be, then I'll move on to another target because for some reason this area, this one little area, is mucking up the program. And now yeah, the as far as the security camera pointing, it's not shouldn't be impacting the the scope at all because it's pointing in. The opposite direction. Let's see how this uh, how this thirty second exposure comes out. And if there's nothing there, I'll move on to another spot. And oops, <laughs> and these things happen. which is fine, it's very, things can be very dynamic. So like I said, uh, what the pros and cons about doing astronomy with a remote setup or with a, you know, if you just sit outside with your rig can be that, yeah, you can sit inside where it's nice and warm, but also things like this might happen where just this gremlin gets in the machine and you don't know what is what or why it's doing that. Where if you have, say, your hand controller outside, you know, you're right there with your system and it's, uh, you know, it's easier to maybe diagnose the problems at the moment. Uh, whereas this, I'm working, you know, I'm working with a Raspberry Pi computer out there and you know, all sorts of, there have been some issues that have kind of cropped up with the ASI Air that 
people I'm gonna I'll, I'll report I'll tell this throw this in a report just kind of let them know that for some reason in this section <laughs> it nothing was responding because you know the plate solving has worked here um, we know where we are and it sink and go to the California nebula and let's see that's all moved guiding stop guiding Refresh the guiding. So now let's pick pick that star. And we'll start guiding there. I wonder if that is Menkib. That's a very bright star right there. So that now also with my <clears throat> my guide camera and or sorry my guide scope and camera and the telescope I haven't quite lined them up to be looking at the exact same object and this kind of comes from the night when I first put everything together and I just kind of slapped the guide scope on top and had the Mickey Mouse and MacGyver that thing on top of there because not all the connections worked because that's the way how it goes <laughs> something isn't gonna fit so we just had to make it fit so I don't have my guide scope correctly aligned with uh, with what I'm looking at. Uh, overall, everything's worked out just fine, but I know I should uh, really align the guide scope properly, but I also need to mount the guide scope properly. And that has come from what I have is a, uh, a Lozmandy bar on top and I have a, a clamp, but the holes don't line up well for the guide scope and really the guide scope mount that I have doesn't work any it doesn't work as well there isn't really like any extra screw holes or any other ways to attach it other than like a single screw which is nice and tight and it's you know it's held its position for the past uh, month and a half now but as I say this you know the Oh, there we go. Let's get the guiding back on track there, shall we? Um, yeah, I really need to get a proper guide scope mount as well. Something that's a little more secure. Sorry, not secure. It's, it's secure on top of there. But just something that I can move between scopes a little easier. Because if I am going to be switching up um, when Orion is back in the sky, I'm going to want to be changing telescopes rather frequently, or much more frequently than I am now. Because I'm also going to, I'm going to want to shoot deep sky and wide field. So being able to have the have a little less headache will be favorable. All right, things are going back on track here. Let's let's see where we're at. Now we are gonna be kind of like in the middle of the California Nebula, and this is a larger um, target, but I think it also can, with this camera uh, set up, it could lend itself well to a really, really big mosaic image and Again, that's something that could be pretty interesting to uh, to explore in the future because this, <clears throat> you know, it's early enough in the evening right now at 11 o'clock. And see how long do I have that available in the sky? Actually, when was it? So really from about, about 8.30 until pretty much almost three in the three in the morning I could have this target available for me uh, that's also including a meridian flip 
but that's uh yeah that's gonna be i could that could be quite a project to actually do a large mosaic of the california nebula so right now i'm just shooting a small portion of the nebula for those of you who have joined in uh thank you very much for stopping by and we are shooting live images from outer space and uh, with my telescope and dedicated astronomy camera and let's kind of do a quick look at our overall setup we are looking at the california nebula which let me bring that up in stellarium which is in the constellation of perseus and that is this large red patch of hydrogen alpha gas and this square sensor the square box is the camera sensor and the focal length that i'm using right now on the telescope and the telescope is right here <laughs> yeah i got it right i've been making sure that i'm pointing in the right direction because <laughs> obviously my mirror my camera is mirrored on here so and that stellarium is a program is a free program that you can get that will show you the areas of the night sky kind of the objects that are that are out there so we um i use this program to kind of pre-plan what's available for me in the nights in the in the sky so i can get a rough idea of where i'm going to be shooting what uh, targets are going to be available for how long it will depend on what i'm going to be shooting what i'm going to what kind of project i'll be doing most of the time i do want to be able to do these kind of 10 minute images single shots of the night sky just to kind of show you guys around see what's out there and yeah we'll uh, i don't know about going to the pleiades well that is a really interesting it's a really nice as a wide field target but for the filter that i'm using it may not pick up all the dust that's uh, reflecting the starlight around there because the filters i'm using are better with emission nebulas and those are areas of the sky that are kind of star forming regions or areas of um, like I said, hydrogen alpha gas that's being excited by the radiation being given off by the, the stars that are forming. Now there's also this little tiny one, the crystal ball nebula, which is the planetary nebula. And I think at longer focal lengths, it would be very interesting to have a look at. And you'd definitely be able to resolve some more details. And, you know, I haven't... I'm going to give this one a go because... The, for some reason, the Embryo Nebula didn't out. So, I think, again, this is another one of those targets that I've only kind of roughly caught in a wide field view and definitely wasn't able to get much of any um, detail pulled out of there. So, after the, in the next oh, five, next five minutes, we'll have the image of the California Nebula that'll be uh that'll be finished and then yeah we'll move on to the to the crystal ball nebula and try out a new target so that'll be the first time for me imaging it um you know being focused on that and uh, yeah it'll be the first time to be shown on this channel yet so that'll be in the next uh about well, the next 15 minutes that image will come through there because we'll process it no we'll process this image all I do is this little uh, bar down here on the ASI Air. Uh, that's that area up in the right side there. That's part of my Raspberry Pi controlled computer from the ZWO product. And I am just doing a histogram stretch on the images as they come through just to be able to highlight the, uh, just increase the contrast on that image a little bit there. So I'm not actually doing a full process of this image. Usually I'm doing image processing on, processing on um, Saturday nights. And 
that's kind of almost become my default rainy day astronomy. And like I said, unless, although unless it's clear out, then I'll be doing more of this with the live astrophotography, taking more pictures. And we do have a main portion of the Milky Way kind of going overhead right now. So that's um, full of a lot of targets that are available for uh, some good viewing. And we'll, there's, like I said, there's tons of targets that are available. So it's, there's gonna be some same targets I'm gonna go to, like I said, old reliable images, um, but I'm always gonna try to do at least one or two new targets out of the night. And as we saw a little earlier, that didn't pan out too well because for some reason, choosing the Embryo Nebula, NGC 1333, it caused some issues with the ASI Air and it didn't want to process ever, it, or it didn't want to recognize where it was in the night sky. So, which was um, a first for me, at least for tonight, where um, generally the, uh, the program has worked out pretty well. So, I get just one of those weird little gremlins that pops up and um, just kind of got to go with it, really. Because I don't want to have to restart everything. And for the sake of that, like everything's working fine now. So I don't know what that little hiccup was. But we'll see in the next uh, two minutes. We'll have an image of the California Nebula. And this will be, we're going to be very, very close in. We're going to be very zoomed in on this target. But the trade-off is that you're going to see more, you got a chance to see more details in the, you know, in the structure of the, of the whole thing. So let me just get some information on the California. I have shot the California Nebula in the past and actually this was the area of the sky where I did catch a meteor in one of my images when I was taking a, I was doing five minute exposures and a meteor had photobombed the image and totally happy with that. More than acceptable for something like that to, um, to pop up in the, in the feed there or in your image. Cause usually if you're being run by overrun by satellites or airplanes, it's not, uh, yeah, it's not favorable. So yeah, always happy to have a meteorite because um, so there's, so about every day, the earth plows through approximately hundreds of millions of tons of debris. And most of them are just tiny little grains of sand. And yeah, every little bit that kind of collides with the atmosphere, it's gonna leave, you're gonna get your meteorites or your shooting stars and yeah, it's kind of, it's cool to capture those in your images. And because I am a, such a long focal length, um, there's a less chance that I'm going to catch them in like in these kind of photos. Whereas if you're shooting like a much wider field at like, you know, 200 millimeters or even wider, if you're doing like a DSLR, if you're intentionally aiming to get those, um, to get those images, especially during a meteor shower. Um, yeah, you just have that better chance at a wider field of view to catch them. So the ASI Air has finished its 10 minute exposure. And that is part of the California Nebula and actually the part that I was really, It'll center on certain areas when you pick your target, and this is exactly where I wanted it to be, which is rather fortunate. Have you tried ever capturing the eclipse with your scope or camera? Um, I have wanted to, but I haven't been in the position to actually capture that. I have shot the, there's a, a lunar eclipse 
and that was uh, last season. And it was actually at a time when everybody were, you know, lots of people were broadcasting it. And there was actually a meteor strike on the moon, which is really, really cool because everybody was documenting this. And you know, hundreds of people who were taking pictures of the moon caught this, uh, this event, which was really cool because it was so well documented that they were able to get a lot of uh, interesting data and just kind of pull up some information on you know, where this little, little rock had kind of come from. So I was actually shooting the moon. I was doing, uh, I was f photographing the moon well, that when that happened, unfortunately, uh, my all my exposures were in between that strike. I had, I, I basically had one on either side of the event. So I personally, I totally missed it, which was unfortunate. However, being able to watch the moon, um, you know, go into the Earth's shadow through the telescope was really cool, as well as um, you know, just watching it away from the scope and just kind of experiencing it that way but that's um yeah for eclipse wise that's the most i've caught on camera myself um it's not that i don't really go for uh, moon photographs or planetary uh, i think a lot of my interest kind of does come with the um uh, with the nebulas so the uh, kind of the interesting thing about our moon and sun combination is that uh, you know the sun's distance and the moon's distance and size makes it the only area in the solar system where we have a total solar eclipse. So every other planet is going to have either their moons kind of going to um, they're not going to be close enough or in the right proximity to actually have a total solar eclipse. So count ourselves lucky on that astronomical event. Right, so we have our image of the California Nebula. And again, this is just out of, this is, this shot is immediately out of the camera with no processing done to it yet. Um, no, I don't want to become famous bot. <laughs> um, don't click on that image. Don't click on that link. Can I delete those messages? All right, I can give them one chance. Can you delete your own messages? Anyway. Right. So the image is, like I said, right under the camera. And this is using the ASI 533MC Pro. And I'm cooled to minus 10 degrees. And, oof, guiding us all over the place. Right. Um, so the benefit of cooling your camera is that you're left with a more smoother image and definitely being able to see more detail within the, the image there. Well, let's... I will... There we go. I will play mod myself at the moment there. I, I didn't think I was actually popular enough to warrant having any bots kind of come in. I'd say that's a weird mark of moderate achievements. I'll just keep an eye on that there. Um, hmm. 
Right, I still have a bit of that gradient that could be from the... <laughs> That's it, yeah. You know you've made it when you get spammed with bots. <laughs> That's it. You were here. You guys witnessed it. This was the first bot that I've encountered. Um, I guess I've, I, I've seen worse pop into other people, so I'll uh, count myself fortunate on that one there, that it wasn't anything ridiculous. Um, so yeah, I'm still getting this gradient, and that's basically until uh, one one in the morning when the street lights turn out, that'll start to go away because there is just that. There's only so, there's so much that the filter is going to do on a one shot color camera because there still has to be enough light coming through there. But again, with uh, post processing, processing is um, is able to, you're able to get rid of those gradients, so. I will do a little stretch on this so we can kind of start seeing some some contrast against the uh, the cloud the the nebula Let's turn off that guide we don't need that right now yeah and it's on the left right right in the, the middle left that dark cloud that's uh, that's just that's in front of the of the nebula there i always thought that was just an interesting part because it does um spread out a little more as you get longer exposures on there and bring it out more details but uh yeah so as astro uh, photographs go like i said you want to keep stacking your images on images on top of each other to average out that noise and really increase your signal. Now I am using the original ASI Air and the Pro version which came out last year, uh, that one has a live stacking feature so I could, you can do shorter exposures but uh, you can kind of keep stacking them up on top of each other and build your image up rather than what I'm doing here with taking a single image and being able to share that with you right away we're not uh, you know there is a little bit of faff in between so you're not kind of seeing that image build up we're just waiting for that single image to pop through the the display there but um i think i part of the excitement is you know is, is waiting for this image to come through so we're not just seeing this image slowly um appear we're just getting it one, one image and there we go but I think the uh, for the ASI Air Pro I do like the idea of that live stacking feature because that can at least um, help eliminate some of the noise and just have a better a little bit of a better signal that's coming through there but I've also seen that the the Wi-Fi signal on the on the ASI Air Pro isn't as strong and a lot of people are adding their own Wi-Fi antenna uh, Wi-Fi extenders on there so I do hope that in the future for maybe the uh, the pro you know what version 1.5 they've done something to improve the Wi-Fi signal strength on there somehow or for the whatever the third version is going to include you know but yeah uh, definitely liking this image uh, totally ignoring the the color gradient in there but uh, they what I found most appealing about this camera was that there is no amp glow in this uh, in the camera where you would get from the like the 294 MC Pro which is a popular version of the uh, of the uh, ZWO cameras along with the ASI A183 and that was uh, another thing that kind of attracted me to this camera was that I wasn't dealing with any of that that bright glow that was coming from the from the kit itself So it looks really good. Are there a few overlays? Uh, with this, there's um, 
nothing that's kind of been processed with this image at all. It's just the image that's straight out of the camera and we're just adjusting the the histogram. So kind of highlighting some of the uh, the areas of detail in there. But usually with when I'm doing these photographs, I'll shall, uh, I shoot multiple images and they'll stack on top of each other. And in my rainy day astronomy videos, you, I have um, done some of that from start to finish. So I have multiple images that are registered and stacked on top of each other. You kind of get rid of the noise uh, to a lesser degree, and then you have more of your signal. So all of this, these the clouds of nebulosity, the dark, um, the shaded areas, and the stars just kind of are going to pop out a lot better. So yeah, this uh, yeah, Dusty, this is the ASI 533 that I'm using right now. And yeah, when they say <clears throat> when they say zero zero amp glow, they freaking mean it. <laughs> um, I've been even with my DSLR. I've I've noticed that there is uh, there, there's amp glow on there, not as sharp as I've seen with uh, some of the other ASI cameras, but but there, for the DSLR, there's definite uh, this even bulb of kind of lighter areas on the side, but this one, the 533, absolutely nothing. Um, you know, there's still the the regular kind of noise that's going to pop through, especially being a little aggressive on things here. But there's nothing that's really taking away overall from the image that's really glaring, uh, save for my street lights causing this gradient. But yeah, I've uh, become more than happy with this camera and this camera choice. And really when anybody's kind of debating on which camera they want to buy and they are mentioning the 533 and I just <laughs> I want to say like, don't even debate it get the 533 but it, everybody's personal tastes are gonna be a little different okay so you my 294 definitely does have a bit of glow for sure yeah so you're using the 294 um, yeah because you'll have that on the I guess the right side you get those kind of the like the spikes of light coming out the side there. But that can be also, you know, you can process that out when you're when you're doing your dark frames anyway. Uh, however, just for what I'm looking to achieve on this was, um, like I said, doing the live astrophotography. I think having that amp glow for things like this would just be a little uh, annoying almost. And then just kind of having to basically explain that out every time. I thought that uh, that would just come a little tedious. So yeah, for the purpose of uh, what I've been looking to do here, the 533 has been fantastic. And I am using a 0 0.6 focal uh, reducer and flattener that was actually I was using with my refractor with my 72 ED refractor and just on a on a whim <laughs> the first night when I had the when I got the RC8 I just kind of tossed that in there hoping uh, for the best really oh, okay. um, Okay, I gotta fix those transitions. Um, yeah, you can see on the, eh, no you can't. <laughs> but I do have the uh, focal reducer on there. And that was a that was an Altair Astro uh, light wave. And yeah, I just threw that in there just on a whim, just see how it worked. And it, it worked, I got, um, I was able to get my, achieve, I was able to achieve focus with it. And yeah, I haven't taken it out since, so. You know, it's improved the, the focal ratio on the scope as well. And again, why I'm able to kind of share these images, it's not quite, you know, it's not a, a, the speed of a Rasa at, uh, 
you know, like F2. But, you know, it, it does the, it definitely does the job. And while I do want to try it without the, uh, without the reducer to kind of get that vocal length. Um, yeah, I want to, you know, I'll have to probably spend it, you know, do the 10 minutes at minimum to get any, uh, any shots there. Yeah, yep, no time for flats or darks with these. That's it. No, just get it out there. And yeah, I'm totally like beyond happy with this uh with this camera. And I think it's one of the one of the best investments that I've made in in all of this because it's just like going from a DSLR to an astronomy dedicated camera is there's absolutely no comparison between the performance you know I you know it's a, if it, it's a difference between a a bicycle and a Formula One car you know there's you know both are going to get you to where you need to go but obviously the there's a yeah, higher performance with the Formula One car so yeah something like this like this image with my DSLR would have been impossible. Like, I know, I gotta make another window to pull up just random pages. Um, my, I have an image of the of the California Nebula. That was basically the single five minute shot from my DSLR that is, you can barely see anything of the Nebula in there. Just a faint red smudge almost. Um, definitely no, no details like this that we're getting out of the uh, you know the focal length notwithstanding but just being able to catch those uh, those details with uh, being able to bring down that camera sensor temperature so I think that is yeah again it's the, the area of the California nebula I did kind of want to catch because that little uh, little dark area a little dark cloud that's being that's in shadow there i think that's just one of the more interesting parts of the nebula save for the galaxy that you can see behind the nebula and i do have that shot of the of the california nebula with this scope and catching the galaxy behind it and that's on my instagram page and uh yeah that was kind of one of the first images i think i really did a good processing on from the using the rc8 so, and that was, again, it was one of those targets I wasn't really anticipating um, shooting or at least processing uh, the, for the first time. I was almost really hoping that the Crescent Nebula would have still been available because I would have wanted to get that with the, um, with my refractor telescope at a wider focal length and kind of compare that against the DSLR, although there's not really a great comparison. Um, yeah, uh, well, yeah, to say that there, yeah, there is no comparison at all. Um, yeah, these cameras, they like, you know, it's built into the name for astronomy dedicated cameras. There is no, for those who may not be familiar with it, these cameras don't have any viewfinder or anything um, visible on there because that's just, uh, let's jump back to the, the scope view there. The camera on the back here, you know, you can't, uh, you have to plug it into a computer or, you know, something like the, uh, the Raspberry Pi controller because that's all it is, is this cylinder on the back and uh, you got your power running there for the for your cooling fan, and this the USB out to your to your source. So, yeah, its sole purpose is taking images of space, and and it does it really well. And for the most part, I would say there really isn't a really bad camera to choose from, especially if you're going from a uh, from a DSLR and it really kind of comes down to what your what your goals are going to be for uh, astrophotography 
because if you want to get if you're going to want to do planetary then your best bet is to kind of go for a smaller sensor which can process those images much quicker and especially with the ASI Air Pro where they've added the video capture feature on there so you're able to now just use your whole system to capture those images um, much quicker because you have your smaller sensor you don't have such a bigger readout um, this sensor I have is is uh, an inch squared sensor and when I was shooting images of Mars sorry oh the voice is going I think I've, I've realized what my limit of streaming as much as I want to do like a you know go for another two three hours talking for you know three hours straight is still still kind of new to me because you know um, there really isn't another voice on the end to kind of pick up a little bit of the slack it's just me talking to you guys but I'm also talking to you know my myself <laughs> but um, I do thank everybody who has kind of popped in everybody who has come in join the stream right now thank you guys very much for uh, stopping by and we are doing some live astronomy uh, photograph or imaging um, some images from space so I'm going to continue on with things because the weather is clear it is yeah I'm gonna say I know I'll, I'll have a look at things in about uh, 45 minutes or so we'll kind of gauge it from there like I said it's been it's been quite a while since we've had a clear night and you know I'll uh, you know, yeah, I'll have a nap tomorrow after work. I don't care. I'll, you know, um, I think I'll almost be at the mercy of the dew point because I still haven't got a dew band heater for this telescope yet. And uh, yeah, that's definitely going to uh, be a factor. So I think uh, that, yeah, that's definitely going to be my next purchase. I was thinking about changing my broadband filter but I think I'm gonna to have to put that money towards uh, preventing any fogging of my lenses. You're doing awesome. Thank you, Mojo Jojo. Appreciate that. I also like saying your name too. <laughs> it's just, you know, funny, like, um, my mother used to have, uh, they, she had lambs called Mojo and Jojo. Um, years ago when she was uh, they had a, a farm or her mother had a farm and they had two little lambs that they would play with and there's Mojo and Jojo and one day they couldn't find Jojo and they had lamb for dinner and they cried <laughs> she tells the, she tells that story every time and it just gets you it's like oh <laughs> you're eating your pets although they didn't know they were pets they or that they weren't pets but hey also I don't think about eating lamb when I say your name it's just you know it's fun to say mojo jojo <laughs> oh god let's pick another target <laughs> uh. right so we were on the California nebula and I think we're going to go to the crystal ball nebula like I said a brand a new one to my to my eyes it's a tiny planetary nebula so it's gonna be you know like a little um, it'll be small in the sensor but I've been able to zoom in and get a half decent shot of things so let's uh, I don't know if I'd save that down image is already saved okay so we have that saved now let's I'm going to check everything. Sorry, with guiding, guiding's all right. It's a little shaky. I think that's uh, just kind of coming along to working on the balance. I thought that my right ascension was was really well well balanced but 
maybe have to fine tune things a little more. Right, so that's save. Do a quick exposure, make sure plate solving is working. And yeah, I usually do, like I'm shooting at minus 10. I could probably push it to minus 15, maybe minus 20. Um, but I also don't want to really start to frost up the sensor, especially if we're going to be approaching the dew point shortly. So, and everything has kind of worked out well at, uh, at minus 10 anyway. I don't think I really need to, to go much cooler than that. All right, so that's fine. This is all success. Let's sync that. It knows where we are, and we are going to NGC 1514. That is the that's well, a dim planetary nebula. Well, let's see how it goes. Like I said, maybe something good. Maybe something bad. Let's see the scope moving down there. Everybody's happy. Sluice position, validate, centered, solving, solved. All right, so the embryo nebula, which I wanted to shoot earlier isn't responding for some reason. Ooh, already, okay. Now, I don't care the stars are blurry. There's already that glow of the planetary nebula right in the center there. So I'm, I'm already excited for this image. Like, we have, there's, it's just star chills from the, you know, the, the scope moving into position there. But, uh, Oh, that looks good already. I think I might pick a new gar guide star, though. That one seems a little dim. Now, I am at, yeah, I'm fine at three seconds. That's fine. Let's pick one that's got a little, little more, a little more luminosity to it. We'll guide on that one there. Yeah, no, okay. No, well, I thought this was going to be, but I thought it was going to be almost smaller than what we're seeing right now. So, let's do a, let's just double check, make sure it knows where it is. Yeah, all right, okay. I am going to start imaging that right now. Now, had this been like earlier in the, I did do earlier on in the night, I did start off with a 16 minute exposure of the Pac-Man Nebula. And I'd started that one before we kind of got rolling on things. And I think definitely you're gonna get, I'm getting more detail out of the images when I'm doing 16 minute exposures, but I'm also really running the risk of any satellites popping in, um, any, weird little errors in guiding. They've got a better chance of the stars becoming elongated. And to be fair, they actually, they were kind of, um, they're minorly oblong and at a distance, that's fine. But I can sometimes be a bit of a pixel peeper and I do like that I've been able to get round stars uh, rather frequently. So yeah, definitely 16 minutes is, is good for doing this. <laughs> um, like. Definitely, I wouldn't rely on my mount too much for doing that regularly. Um, even when I did like 10 minute exposures, like because I was shooting uh, last, actually been the, back in March when uh, things kind of went a little sideways, I was using my uh, Celestron 127 SLT uh, Schmidt-Cassegrain telescope and 
that one was 50, uh, shooting at 1500 millimeters, but also at f12. So, and, and using a DSLR camera. So I would need to shoot with, um, like I was doing 10 minute exposures, mainly to actually try to get any detail out of there. However, the flip side was that the sensor was heating up to about 30 degrees. And so you could, you know, the noise on that was ridiculous. So I think the only really good image that came out of that was the Whirlpool Galaxy. Um, out of that, there was the Owl Nebula that I shot and the Ring Nebula, which still hasn't actually been processed. I am, it's not that I'm reticent to process it, but I just, I don't, I never got the, uh, the darks sorted out for those, for that, uh, that set. So yeah, the temperature was all over the place. So really kind of getting a, uh, a series of darks for that. Uh, the darks are when you cover up the lens cap and just shoot the camera without any light. Um, uh, yeah, it was all over the board, so something like that. And the ring nebula was still fairly, fairly small at that focal length. Um, so it was almost still at, at 1500 millimeters. It was still a bit of a wide field image. And what else I shoot? I shot the uh, sheriff, but I didn't shoot the deputy. And oh, what was the other one? There was, there was four, four main targets out of that, uh, that, those sessions. There was the Whirlpool Galaxy, the Ring Nebula, the Owl Nebula, and I have to check on there. Yeah, uh, noise noise central for sure. Winter is the only time I like using my DSLR. Yeah, uh, I have I would have given up um, in the summertime with my DSLR, the drop of a hat, because yeah, just way too much noise in there. Um, and again, shooting at a, you know, at F12, you know, I was, I was running an uphill battle uh, in the snow. So, okay, I gotta find out what that other, that fourth image was. What was that? the pinwheel galaxy so the whirlpool galaxy the ring nebula the owl the owl nebula and the pinwheel galaxy and i think out of those four the whirlpool galaxy fared the best out of everything um and that came in part to i shot my dark frames pretty much the I did a few every night so uh kind of averaged out a little bit there um but yeah, for the other images, they they could use a little work. Um, yeah, if you check on my on my Instagram page, back from yeah twenty sixth of March through yeah through to about the fourteenth of May, there's some of those images were processed and you know played with a little bit. So just experimenting with some of them. I think even from them, I would probably want to go back and reprocess some of them again, just from picking up some new uh, new ideas that other people have shared. So yeah, it's, uh, it's always worth kind of, if you're getting frustrated with processing any of your images, is really just kind of take a break from them for a bit. And yeah, revisiting old images isn't, uh, there's nothing wrong with that because your, your skill set is gonna change um, in like probably leaps and bounds really. So you never know how that's gonna, how that's gonna go. So you're always experimenting, always picking up something new. And, you know, even with, um, what's the latest thing I kind of found was, uh, from, from Aaron from AV Astronomy. He was talking about this, uh, just these curves presets called ArcSign. And it just, it has really helped with star bloats and just keeping those stars at uh you know at a bit at a minimum with without running the script to reduce stars on things it's uh 
that's helped out a lot just that little just finding out that little um that little bit of information of just these presets that have worked out really well and unfortunately uh, because twitch for some reason or obs doesn't show how photoshop um responds or at least or sorry doesn't show all the the, the extra windows in photoshop you can't uh, see those. So I think what I'm, what I might do is do my regular rainy day astronomy, but also go back and just record one of those videos for, uh, for YouTube and share that just so you can kind of see what uh, windows and what settings I'm playing with there while I'm talking about it. So you can kind of get an idea. I know for those who may not be familiar with Photoshop, you, you know, me explaining or trying to create a, you know, a a visual for you isn't the the best way to understand what I'm doing so at least uh, yeah if I can kind of put one of those videos out give that a watch and just kind of get a better idea of what we're uh, what we're doing you can kind of understand what uh, what I'm what I'm banging on about there So I think let's uh we got two minutes. And all right, I'm going to have a quick look. There's my cursor. There's my cursor. Because we are shooting the NGC fifteen fourteen, the crystal ball nebula. And so it's a di very dim planetary nebula, however it is showing up rather nicely in a five second exposure so I'm excited to see how that's going to turn out and I know it's not going to be as uh, as crisp and clear but I think it'll be very interesting to see so uh, we'll just kind of read this straight out of Sky Safari that NGC 1514 is characterized by a very dim, smooth outer shell, which is a much brighter inner shell and bright blobs. Measurements of the gas near its center indicate that it is expanding outwardly at 25 kilometers per second. The morphology of this nebula is thought to be caused by the presence of a binary star instead of a single star at the center. All right, so it is a possibly binary star system. That's that's interesting, because usually when you see the planetary nebula, it is. Uh, it's basically just going to be one star that has shed its outer layers so that'd be that'd be kind of cool and the stars orbit each other with a period of about four to nine days uh, gas is presumably expanding away from the larger star uh, the larger star of the pair which was probably three to four times the ma as massive as our Sun so we got the one star shedding its outer layer and this other star just being bombarded by the material from that other star. So while we're waiting for that to come through, which is going to be done fairly soon, I'm just having a look in Why are none of these, let's see, enter object name. No, it, it seems that a lot of the targets I'm looking for in Space Engine just aren't readily available some for some reason. So I was hoping to let's see. have to spend more time in Space Engine as much as I'd like to kind of 
pop that in there. <laughs> it's the images seen on Google of the planetary nebula. It looks almost like a flower. Yes. So let's see. All right, I'm I am seeing a larger version of this right now. Let's. Let's have a better look at this one. I mean, right out of the right out of the camera. Already happy with that. Like, like I think that's a target that's going to deserve some time done on there because, yeah, that's. That is so cool. Okay, so even, I think if I had taken out the focal reducer, it would be a much tighter image. Maybe not as bright, and that would definitely be, you know, this would probably be at its the native focal length, and you'd probably get a little more detail coming through on there. But let me let's see if we can brighten things up around there. Or at least uh, adjust the contrast. Let's take this right to the cross of the RGB. I might start blowing out the stars and details otherwise. Yeah, no, I think that's pretty damn cool. So we can see, I'm going to, I'm going to zoom right in, just kind of really, uh, really amplify things at the moment. But I believe, so we have our, here's our bright star right in the core, but it looks like just to the right that tiny little red kind of star looks like that is its companion star if that's the one that they're talking about there um i have to maybe double check on that a little more because they are they, they still don't seem to be sure if it is a binary star or not uh also because the distances between all these stars in this image that we're looking at are going to be much greater than we can uh, we can get from a, a 2D image, and that's where Space Engine would come in handy. So if I could maybe find out what star if I can pinpoint a star, then maybe we can journey to that area. Or at least look in the direction of of Perseus. But yeah, that's the uh, is your crystal ball nebula, one that I've never shot before. And I think really at any other focal length that uh, that I'd had available, um, it just wouldn't be wouldn't be that practical to shoot. So, and okay, it's, I mean, it's big, but it's also uh, just at about 2,400 light years away from us. Now, a uh, comparison of other things that are of a similar kind of, well, not a similar distance, but the Orion Nebula, which is much larger and much brighter, is, which would definitely, the Orion Nebula will take up way more, it'll fill the whole image. Um, the whole sensor size when I'm able to image that and that's about 1300 light years away from us um, so while this planetary nebula is double that distance it's still let's see if they know have a rough idea of when this all kind of so it discovered in 1790 And it was discovered by William Herschel. I'll have 
there's a lot of story about this of what uh, what Herschel said about it, but it is a. I mean, also when people were imaging or doing visual astronomy. Uh, in the early days of telescopes and um, any types of binocular, the, you know, there's there's less city lights. Um, I say less. I mean, there was no city lights, so you know you're able to get. You may not be able to get the resolution, but you're able to pick out, um, I guess, some fainter objects without you know, when you're really only worrying worrying about the moon causing you. Um, some issues. But yeah, that's uh, that is it. I'm saving that one for sure. That is saved. And like I said, once I kind of get uh, something set up, like a, a Discord server or something like that, I'll uh, definitely get a collection of these images that we've captured and post them up on there. Now, it, it's not really there's not really much that can be done beyond processing. Uh, processing these images afterwards because this is, a, is still going to be a bit of a um, of a compressed JPEG in the end. Like I won't, uh, I there is ways you can kind of get in and get the FITS files out of there. And if I can figure that out, then yeah, I'll throw the the FITS files out as well, and we'll uh, you know you can, anybody can take a crack at uh, further processing the a single exposure all right dusty thank you very much you're being summoned by your four little demons it's time for me to carve pumpkins all right well enjoy park uh, carving your pumpkins there dusty and thank you very much for stopping by appreciate that very much thank you uh, for the kind words and we'll uh, hopefully see you around the next time and um, yeah no definitely um, have a good one enjoy the the great pumpkin take care man So, we will pick out, you know, I, I, I kind of want to look at the Pleiades, but I know this, they're so, all those stars are going to be so bright, and it's just going to, it's really just going to blow things out. But I guess I, I would be remiss if I didn't even give it a, give it a bit of a shot and pick out, I'm just going to pick one of the stars out of the, uh, Out of the complex there. And all right, let's just pick. I guess that's pronounced Merope or Merope. Again, it's probably going to be way too bright. I probably won't even um, get a full. If I try and do 10 minutes, I think it's going to blow things right out not found okay so I guess it's just gonna go for the okay what is the it's also labeled the Merope Nebula which has uh, well let's see NGC 1435 we'll see how that 1435 Oops. Okay, so it's probably just going to pick. Well, we'll see how that goes. Now we're we're not too far from the Pleiades at the moment. We are just if you're looking at it, we're just a little uh, a little to the west. doing the same thing as it was with the with the embryo nebula it doesn't want to confirm where it is all right 
let's wait for the guiding to I'm not going to wait for the guiding to settle down I'm going to restart the guiding now according to the guide scope let's see if we can see any I don't know if we're even on there we'll give it a quick look we'll do a quick exposure and see if we can get a rough idea of where we are Let's do 10 seconds as soon as that's all done there. Now, yeah, uh, th things, once again, uh, like to happen with, with the program, and that's fine. These, these are all right. Um, yeah, so leave with the image of the crystal ball nebula and we'll have a look at where we are Let's see if we're kind of within that some area of the Pleiades and again it's a reflection nebula so I may not be able to get a lot of detail out of this area and whether or not everything kind of moved moved to the area there let's fix that I could be anywhere and if it doesn't want to plate solve then I'm not gonna I'm not gonna know where we're at and I really think if we're actually within the within the Pleiades it would probably be a lot brighter give it one more chance to do 10 or 30 seconds there if not I will change targets and what do we got our foot's at 30 what do we have available actually I might be able to start getting a little bit a little bit of uh, items from the um, from Orion although hmm uh, I don't know although I am happy with these uh, Whenever I'm seeing blue and white and red stars, that I know that the filter and the the white balance is doing its job uh, with the camera, because um, those are those are the colors that you really want to see. Um, there aren't going to be many other shades of stars that you're going to capture out there. So I think that's uh, that's good that it's doing its job like that. I. Let's see what's uh, which one's that? Is that low lowers? Lowers there. That's at thirty-five. All right. I think I'm going to do maybe two more targets because I think we're going to be approaching the the dew point, and then that's just going to start fogging over the uh, the camera sensor. Um. I think that's yeah. It's just going to be um, mildly annoying, disappointing. So we start losing some images there. So I'm going to pick. I'm going to pick a target that is apparently O. That is oxygen three heavy, and we'll see how well that kind of puts this filter to the test. If everything wants to work. So this is a, this will be IC433, a fairly bright nebula, hopefully, in Gemini. Now, IC4443 is a supernova remnant and requires an O3 filter to be seen as an extremely dim, irregularly boomerang-shaped wisp. So, 
we'll see how that goes because this filter does have O3 in it and we are capturing that in more of the green uh, end of the spectrum. So yeah, we'll, uh, we'll go to that and we'll either finish off with the, we'll check out maybe the monkey head nebula, which I think that's one that that one is, or lowers nebula which is just in the constellation of Orion. So, and I think that one is, where is that? We're at 35 degrees. Usually I kind of, um, able to image at about 37 ish degrees above the horizon. Cause then that kind of clears the top of the house. Uh, and actually we'll see where are we at for 39. Yeah, it should be fine for this target. Let's, let's give that a go. I see 443. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very excited for how well these, uh, the skies have held up. It's, like I said, it's uh, looking like rain tomorrow, right up until it clears up at about nine o'clock. And yeah, we are, yeah, we're clear skies right now. We get 13 mile an hour winds, uh, outdoor temperature of about eight degrees. And uh, the dew point is at six but rolling up to seven uh, a little after one in the morning and tomorrow night tomorrow night's looking like it's improving it looks like rain up until about five o'clock and then um petering out just about six o'clock with it's forecasting for clear skies about eight o'clock tomorrow night so if this forecast is going to hold up Definitely going to be coming back tomorrow night for some more astrophotography. And yeah, uh, I would expect a session about the same length of time. It's about three and a half hours, four hours. And yeah, definitely looking forward to that as well. The dew point is looking to hold off for the whole night. So, I mean, not that I probably would stay up until three, but we'll see. If things are going really well, then why not take advantage of this, right? We've been so long, so long without clear skies. Definitely want to, um, definitely want to get as much of this in as possible. So this is the, the target I'm going to. IC four forty three is a new target for me. And oh, 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 let's not hit that button, shall we? Let's go to. Let's go to the scope. Now, what we're seeing, actually what we're seeing right now in the in the scope is this is the constellation, this is the of Taurus. You're seeing the, the, the head of Taurus, the bull right in here, which is also the Hyades. And yeah, so when the, the stars are bright enough to be seen in the, uh, in the night vision scope, that's, a, we have some really calm atmosphere and yeah which is equating to nice clear skies and um, yeah B they're just some super bright stars right so we're going to IC 433 let's see how this goes Hopefully we are just above the roof line. For those of you who are just tuning in, thank you very much for stopping by. We are taking live images of outer space with my eight inch telescope and dedicated astronomy camera. And currently we are going to a new target that I have never imaged uh, myself and that I have yet to have shown anywhere before. So this is a little exciting to see a new target and I usually take about 10 minute exposures just to kind of get the most detail out of there. And we'll, uh, we'll have a look at things in a minute there. Let's go back to the... Where is 
my yes. jump back to the main oh, there we go so I'm using the ASI air yeah, if I can just highlight where we're at with Stellarium Ooh, okay all right here's the deal here's the deal I'm going to image the jellyfish nebula which is going to take up the entire sensor and hopefully it looks like it is a dim target so things are probably going to be not as um, as detailed as this looks to be in the Instellarium. However, let me see where, see if I pick out some stars. Just make sure we're in the, in a good spot there. pick out a little bit of nebulosity in there let's do a quick 30 second exposure just to make sure we're all on the right track there so actually what uh, so I'm gonna go after the jellyfish nebula right now and oh man it is a you can't really see it in here there's either the monkey head nebula or or the Crab Nebula. All right, yeah, so I think I'm definitely gonna have enough time for this target and one more. So, uh, I don't know how to do a poll, but you know, if you wanna see either the Crab Nebula or the Monkey Head Nebula, uh, just let me know <laughs> and I'll let, I'll let one of you guys choose and we'll uh, we'll go from there for the last two targets. So between the monkey head nebula and the crab nebula. And provided that we are on a good spot for the Jellyfish Nebula. I see 443. Four, I just want to make sure that we're on the right. That's 444. Four. That's 443. Four, All right. Well, it looks like we're. if it's like dead center on there I just want to make sure that really I'm almost getting the that leading edge of the nebula you know let's give it a go because there's always ample opportunities to give it another go another night and actually I might want to I think we might be close because that looks like that star in the guide scope could be um, the kind of main star. Propus. Propus. Let's get guiding on. That's about the maximum brightness that I want for a, for a guide star. We're guiding and let's see what happens there. Now this is, it looks like it's one of those targets that will definitely need a, a few 
hours of integration, depending on how this kind of turns out. We'll see if it, because uh, like I said, it's a oxygen three heavy uh, mission nebula. So generally most of them are gonna be uh, hydrogen alpha based. Um, so you're gonna get more of that red channel, but if, if um, what we're kind of seeing in Stellarium um, is any bit of an indication We'll, uh, I mean, it does seem like a very complex area. Like, like it, it said, it is, it is dim. So we'll see how that comes out. It looks like it almost might kind of come out like how the, uh, the Eastern or the, the whole Veil Nebula complex where you see a lot of the uh, kind of similar colors in there as well but this has also been a target that really hasn't been readily available to me in the in the past so I'll definitely be able to well we'll, we'll judge how this looks once it's once that's done uh, processing processing and yeah so there should be more on the Jellyfish Nebula. I want to get a little more information on that there. Because there's definitely more to it than Sky Safari is letting on. So the Jellyfish Nebula is a remnant of a supernova lying 5,000 light years from Earth. Um, latest research points to an, a, an estimate for the age of the supernova remnant to be tens of thousands of years. And this agrees with previous work that pegged IC443's age to about 30,000 years. However, scientists have inferred a much younger age of about 3,000 years for the supernova remnant. So its true age remains a question. So that's, uh, yeah, for this uh, supernova remnant that I'm looking to image for the Jellyfish Nebula, its age is up for contention. Putsy, how you doing, man? Good to see you. I hey, appreciate it. you're on your way to work, but hey, um, yeah, thanks for, you. thanks for popping in. Appreciate that, man. We are, if you do have like five minutes, <laughs> we, uh, we're just getting one more image of what is the Jellyfish Nebula. So uh, if you can stick around, hey, stick around. If not, watch the replay. I'll, we'll have that up there available for you. But uh, no, we've been having clear skies, so taking as much opportunity as they can to soak in as many photons from outer space as possible, because this is what it's all about. Um, it's yeah, it's it's fun to to play some video games, but this is the true nature of what I want this channel to be, and I think it's gone fairly well for actually almost four hours, uh, the longest <laughs> the longest stream I've done yet, and. Really, I thought I was going to have a coffee break, but that didn't. I got a little bit of coffee left. But, uh, yeah, no, uh, for 90% of the time, everything's been working great. There's been a few hiccups with the equipment, but that's, that just, stuff like that just happens. We're, uh, you know, I can be, you're at, we're at the slave, we're at the mercy of technology, really. So once that is, once this one is done imaging, I uh, will either, let's see, we'll move to either the monkey head nebula, which is just the, the neighboring nebula to the jellyfish, or up to one of the more classic nebulas that are, that's being imaged is the crab nebula, labeled as Messier 1. 
discovered by Charles Messier or cataloged by Charles Messier which is another supernova remnant which has a pulsar at the heart of this uh, nebula and we have actually what I, think I might do is I I'm going I'm going to make the executive decision because uh, it's my channel <laughs> no I'm going to go to the crab nebula because what I can do while we're doing that is I can definitely jump into space engine and we're going to take a trip directly to this nebula so following the jellyfish nebula we're going to wrap up the evening with the crab nebula and a tour of this uh, structure within space engine so kind of uh, yeah really put a put a button on the evening there but until then we are we are on to the jellyfish nebula which is classified as IC443 and so I'm just kind of looking these are the targets I'm looking at through Stellarium which is a free program that you can have that you can get that will give you enough a rough idea of what we're going to be looking at and so this red box is basically our telescope focal length and the size of our camera sensor so you get a, bit, a good idea of what we ex, what we can expect to see uh, in our image coming up now for Stellarium it targets the jellyfish nebula right here as its kind of centering point and that may be what we're looking at and I think for the most part that's probably what I want to have in the frame is that kind of almost leading at ed leading edge of the of the nebula but I mean even if it actually does center dead on there that's still good because there's gonna be lots to see in that uh, in that area hopefully and it is a it's a supernova remnant that is stronger in the oxygen three um, wavelength, and that is one of the main uh, wavelengths that my uh, filter does allow through to get to the sensor, and that does go in the green channel. And there are more green uh, pixels, uh, more green uh, receptors in the in this Bayer matrix on the. The one shot color camera so hopefully we get some good detail coming through on this and yeah I'm I'm excited to see this one it's a, again it's another one of those targets I wanted to shoot before and really just because of the way how the weather can go in the UK I can lose enough time on a target uh, on a targets window that it's no longer available for me so it's it can be fairly frustrating. Just let me let me change the change the time of day here. So really this is the only the eastern and the northeastern area of the sky is all I kind of have available as the rest of it is blocked by trees and houses. So with a little bit of work in Stellarium, you can add your own backyard, your back garden, um, wherever you kind of have your telescope set up so you can get a, a good idea. Now I do have to adjust my elevation a bit because there are some targets in here that say they're available, but I'm not able to see them. So that would be uh, so I kind of did keep the camera around by the telescope mount itself. So I could, uh, like I said, just have that rough idea of where we're, where we're seeing. But yeah, that's my, uh, what I can see from my garden. Yeah, because it says right now that Orion is much higher than um, than it really is. All right, we are we at fifteen seconds. So let's go over to the ASI Air. Let's see this image come through, and hopefully it's interesting. Uh, yeah, let's see. <laughs> I 
see. Okay, I see where we are. So we kind of missed a bit of that leading edge that's just off to the to the right, or sorry, to the left. But let's punch this up. Yeah, all right, okay. Just sort of that lower left area. Oh, I, I am I'm almost tempted to, to go back. Shoot that one again. Because it looks like it could be Let's see if I can frame this up to where it has. Yeah, it looks like uh, in terms of how it's framed up in Stellarium versus uh, where Stellarium will put it. So you just take a quick look at what uh, uh, the ASI Air has put it dead center of the of that whole nebulous of the nebula complex. So if I pick, if I center on another star, I can catch that leading edge of the of the nebula. And you know what? I'm going to be greedy and do that because I think this this section really owes. Um, really, or sorry, really lends itself well to some great details that are popping out there. I mean, this is this is cool, just as almost as a bit of a teaser in that lower left corner, and uh, just some of the areas in there. That it did say it was a faint nebula, but it does look like again that leading edge is going to show up really, really well. So I'm going to I'm going to save that one anyway because. Everything, all these images are, are going to be worth saving. So let's. I'm going to pick that area as the center point because then I should have that whole leading edge. Of the nebula there. Yeah, I think that's uh, I mean Yeah. Yeah, I think I can already see some of that kind of poking. Just make sure we are where we want to be. I'll run that exposure again and yeah well uh, it might be oh, I'm looking at my guiding and I wonder if I, I'm actually starting to collect some dew on the, the guide scope because things are going all over the place actually this might even be theoretically the uh, See. Maybe not. There, it still looks good on the on the guide scope. There it doesn't look too bad. I do want to start. It's a little a little brighter. maximum that I want to do. All right. Sync map, we know where we are. So, oh. <laughs> well, that was a quick 10 minutes.
All right, that one's after the races. So, what actually will... Uh, Oh, no, I think we're in space engine. We'll uh, we'll check out the Crab Nebula. Actually, I think oh, we're running up on a four hours. B one a.m. I think. We'll uh, we'll get this image um, of the jellyfish nebula sorted out. I don't know why is the guiding going a little wonky. I do do you think dew is going to be starting to be a factor very soon? So. I may I just may be forced to switch things and I switch things up just to kind of yeah, just to kind of uh, call things. So yeah, judging by the guiding, I actually might finish off the night with um, with the jellyfish nebula however I do know that the crab nebula does come up much earlier in the evening so tomorrow night uh, we'll make sure to hit the crab nebula when it is available above the house <laughs> pardon me and we will take a tour of space engine for the crab nebula tomorrow look at the pulsar at the center of that complex and and yeah we'll uh, we'll have a little fun in space engine tomorrow for that um, but yeah like I said tomorrow tomorrow's weather uh, looks raining however everything kind of peters out at about six o'clock so I'm looking to probably probably jump on again about 8 30 9 o'clock tomorrow night that's uh, Greenwich Mean Time. And we will check out some some more nebulae, some more galaxies. Maybe find some star clusters, maybe find some open clusters and have a look at those. Hopefully enjoy two nights in a row of clear skies and be able to catch some because there's well, we didn't like even go to the um, sorry pardon me the flaming star nebula um, get some more time on the tadpoles and there's another which which there's another uh, nebula in that area uh, actually, judging on what's available for here, we could actually do. Um, we'll definitely hit up the Monkey Head Nebula tomorrow night, and I see there's the Spider and the Fly Nebula in Origa. Uh, that's um, that target is more is better suited for wide field, so I'm actually probably going to do the two tar the two bits of there, and we'll kind of put it together in our minds. Freaked me out for a second. Look at OBS disappeared for a moment. I'm thinking, what a what a cliffhanger if that just crashed all of a sudden. So. 
So we still got just uh, five minutes on the Jellyfish Nebula once again to uh, get that leading edge of that supernova remnant. And we get some more information on that there. So just a update on so of a supernova. So when a massive star runs out of thermonuclear fuel, it implodes, forming a dense stellar core called a neutron star. Uh, the outer layers of the star collapse towards the neutron star and then bounce outward in a supernova explosion. A spinning neut neutron star that produces a beam of radiation is called a pulsar. And they, they can be uh, detected through, I believe, FM radio. If you are using like a radio telescope, you can hear a pulsar rotating. And I believe on NASA's uh, SoundCloud, they do have some recordings of, uh, of the, the, of the light waves transferred into sound waves. Um, yeah, the radiation from a pulsar swoops by like a beacon of light from a lighthouse and can be detected as pulses of radio waves and other types of radiation. So yeah, if you uh, are into radio astronomy, um, definitely finding pulsars is uh, an interesting way to, to spend some time. And the good thing about if you're doing like, if you're doing radio astronomy, your, um, your, your telescope can be basically something like a, a mesh of chicken wire that you've kind of bent with your hands because the waves that you're detecting are not going to pass through those uh, the holes in the chicken chicken wire whereas if you're doing something like microwaves you need a you need a very very clear very smooth mirror um, or smooth sensor to detect those because those light waves are so small and so um, focused So that's why with um, something like other uh, telescope arrays, like um, like ALMA, the uh, Atacama Large Millimeter Array, they are a series of dishes that are essentially on tracks and they can either be spread out across miles of desert and basically you're producing a, a, uh, a wider field image or they can all be brought together in a much more concentrated uh, configuration and you, then you're getting more detail because the telescope, the radio telescopes aren't um, spread out over such a, a large swath of uh, area so you're not left to any interpolation like um, such as when you're using a color camera and you have that red, green, green and blue matrix is that when you're trying to kind of um, capture the red data every other pixel that doesn't get uh, doesn't capture the red light has to interpret what the rest of that data is to connect it to the next red pixel so that's why even with the technology of how cameras have kind of come along for uh, the sake of interpolation people used to really um, kind of give the thumbs thumbs down to CMOS sensors which are, are really kind of taken St uh, front and center stage um, and monochrome monochrome still is going to lead the way but in terms of how far CMOS sensors have come along that they're better there's better interpolation and you're going to get a a really good image out of there and I mean as you can see what we've kind of produced tonight uh, I'm very happy with how this kind of this camera performs overall um but yeah, if you're using a monochrome camera, there's no need for interpolation because every ounce of, every bit of light, every photon that comes through is getting recorded. And you're not, the camera isn't guessing. So you are left with a clearer, sharper image uh, with a monochrome camera. However, you do have to, you can only shoot in one wavelength at a time. Uh, unless you are using say like the narrow band uh, filters like the, the tri-band or something like with what OPT, Oceanside Photo and Telescope does in uh, California, 
where they've made this uh, the Triad Ultra filter where they have very very narrow bands of, uh, of light that's coming through you're able to use those as a luminance layer so you're kind of collecting a few wavelengths at once and yeah you can use that to really punch up your image afterwards so let's uh, jump over to the back over to the ASI Air have a look at our jellyfish nebula and hopefully we have caught the leading edge and it looks like there's more to it I may have missed it I, I've never shot this target before so I'm still not familiar with the star field that's in there however I will, I do know for future reference, what section we're looking for. And as much as I missed the mark, I am really happy with how that looks. <clears throat> like, I know it's a tiny little corner of things, but even the the detail, it, this is actually a little brighter than I thought it was going to be. And just those, kind of like the, those billowing waves of that, uh, that radiation coming off from the, from the star. So I do know for the future efforts. I, I will image this again tomorrow night and we'll get that as much of that leading edge visible in the shot. But I think that's pretty cool. So the Jellyfish Nebula, IC443, Supernova Remnant, and the O3 end of the filter, it seems to be doing a really good job. So, yeah, I took a, a, a wrong wrong guess on which star to center in there, but I do know, we'll, we'll go back to that tomorrow, tomorrow night, and I do see which one I want to have centered so we have more of that. Um, of the brighter side of the nebula available. This is also a target that's going to have to be looked at with my 72 ED refractor, which is a much wider field, and I'll definitely be able to get that whole thing, that whole uh, structure within one shot. Um, yeah, definitely we get the entire jellyfish nebula in the whole frame there and a little bit of another uh, open cluster in there so that would look pretty cool so where are we at uh, 10 to 1 yeah all right. now M1 Crab Nebula we're going to go for it and then that's going to be it one more target and I'm going to have to call it a night we'll save that down just make sure everything looking good for everywhere else but yeah uh, it might be, be might get impacted by some of the think mount of the do but everything still looks really good overall so let's look for m1 that is the crab nebula and we will it's going to be a little larger than the crystal ball nebula was earlier so that'll be a little nicer to to look at and we'll see how that I, I, again and this is uh, we're finishing off with one more target that I've never imaged before uh, actually okay 
I have attempted to image the Crab Nebula. However, I was using my older telescope on a mount that was overloaded with too much weight. So it wasn't the best image. It was, I, actually, to be fair, I could barely call it an image. It was very faint and yeah, definitely could not see the whole thing or couldn't get any, any major details out of that there. But let's, let's see, fingers crossed. Everything is going to, is going to work on the last target seems to be Everything's happy. Stars are detected. Target is centered. And faint in the middle. There it is. There is the Crab Nebula right in the middle of the, of the shot. There, that faint little fuzzy. Now, almost for the most part, this could be a fair indication of almost what you would see through a large telescope. It would be a almost colorless smudge throughout the looking at looking at the the image through your telescope there and that's uh, in a way what kind of comes off as almost disappointing for visual astronomy is that these images don't look like they do in the magazines and really that's just because our eyes can't absorb that much light at once um, we're not able to process and store an image, you know, in our retinas to, to you know, to build up um, a meaningful image within our our brains. So we, we really only are seeing the faintest of the image. Whereas when you can open the camera shutter for five, 10, 20 minutes at a time, you're just being able to collect all that light and then be able to process it out. So, yeah, in fact, I'm going to save, I'm going to save that five second shot just so I can use that as reference for what visual astronomy can, what you can expect from that. So that is off to the races. And why I use that expression, I don't know. I'm just, I'm, I'm pretty excited for this target. Um, Actually, I've been pretty excited for most of the targets that we've come out tonight, and very happy with a lot of the results. So, yeah, while that is doing its thing, I will say let's go into let's go into space engine and. I will let's flip over there. And yes, let us start up. Space engine, and we will take a tour from Earth to the Crab Nebula. Now I know it's in there because I looked at it the other day, and uh, we'll see what we kind of what kind of sights we pass along the way to the Crab Nebula. Engine. 
is running. And that's here. That's home. That's us. Let's. And there's the sun. Really, we are looking at Europe. I just love the, the even in this one the, the effects are uh, really cool love it okay so let us point out m1 m1 to orient the screen in the way that I'm seeing the night sky. Uh, fortunately, traveling at 10,000 kilometers per second is going to take us a long time to try to get to 6,500 light years away. <laughs> so we are going to have to pick up the pace just a little bit. Now, while we're Let's pick up the pace. Let's go at. I mean, even if I moved at the speed of light, it would still take us 6,500 years. My battery would probably die by then. So we're going to travel faster than the speed of light on the way to the Crab Nebula. And we're moving at one astronomical unit. So that is 93 million miles per second. Now we're pretty much going to have to be traveling at you know, one, one light year per second. And even then, it's going to take us a while to get to the Crab Nebula at 6,500 seconds. Well, so that would be quite a long, a long live stream just to here we are we're going from earth to the crab nebula so the crab nebula is one of the most famous and conspicuous supernova remnants in the sky and it's centuries old old wreckage of a stellar explosion first noted by chinese astronomers in 1054 the crab pulsar a neutron star rotating at 30.2 times per second lies at the heart of the crab nebula The supernova that created the Crab Nebula is first noted as a guest star by Chinese astronomers on the 4th of July, 1054 AD. So when a supernova explodes uh, in our galaxy, basically you're, it is most likely going to be visible during the day and it'll appear as a, a brand new star in the sky. Now, we haven't had any supernovas in our galaxy um, in quite a while and usually it's almost once every hundred years in a way we're kind of due there have been countless uh, supernovas discovered in uh, other galaxies and well-documented ones however we haven't really seen anything recently Okay, so G goes to your target. <laughs> All right, so this is the Crab Nebula. 
This is the supernova remnant that I am after right now that we are imaging as we speak. And it looks like there is about two minutes to go on that target and also well timed because it looks like the guiding is starting to go. And that may be because the dew is building up on the front of the guide scope. Now the cool thing about Space Engine is that you can take this 3D tour of the object. Now it does look like it is some kind of some a lot some flat layers built up on there, but I also do believe in the newer version that the graphics are a lot more refined. So I think uh, yeah, like I said, the next bit of gear that I'm going to look forward to to purchasing is the dew heater and the 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 dew control and the dew bands for the telescope so I can eliminate any chance of the mirrors fogging up and then for any bit of tech it's going to be upgrading to the new uh, purchased version of Space Engine which has much more refined controls and uh, and features So this supernova remnant is the result of this star, this pulsar in the middle. And I said, like it said, spinning at 30.2 rotations per second. I think we can zoom right in on that pulsar as well. on this neutron star. Maybe, maybe not. Pulsar, which seems very much like a neutron star. There we go. Let's track the neutron star. to approach it a little slower. A little more finesse, as it were. There you go, the energy, this almost accretion disk that forms around a neutron star. Very similar to a black hole, except we can see the light from the star. And I think space is just awesome and 
to be able to see something like this would be incredible. And you can see, oh, no, I'm sorry. That's just the, uh, the green crosshair. I thought they could actually put in some relativistic jets and that'd be like the, the energy, the radiation kind of coming out of the poles. However, it looks like our image of the Crab Nebula is complete. This is what is responsible for the Crab Nebula. This pulsar that exploded, this star in 1054 AD. created that supernova remnant and our image is done so let's have a look and this is the real crab nebula shot through an 8 inch telescope at a 10 minute exposure This is right out of the camera. Gotta bump that up a bit there. And there we go, that pulsar that we were just looking at generated in space engine there's the actual thing right in the middle there and we can't take a 3d tour of this one but you can just see the the tendrils of the gas expanding outwards from this now there's some amazing images from chandra x-ray observatory yeah, that's combined with let's see from the x-ray wavelength and then there's a visible spectrum and there's many other layers to this whole nebula that are absolutely gorgeous but that's our that is our crab nebula that is messier one the first object on charles messier's list of astronomical images. So this has been an incredible night and I'm so happy that the weather has held off. I think I've just basically kind of hit the point of the, the, the dew point now. So definitely going to pack things in and weather permitting, we'll be back tomorrow around 8.30, 8.45-ish and we'll pick some new targets to look at we'll go back to some previous targets that we've seen in the past just to um just to ooh and awe at those as well because everything out there is absolutely beautiful so i thank everybody who has popped in said hello and i appreciate all you guys for your i appreciate you guys for your follows um again mojo jojo uh jay tenko um Haskin Dustin, uh, I appreciate you guys popping in, saying hi, and I hope you, everybody who was here enjoyed themselves, and maybe learned a little something, and I have, I'm so happy to be able to share this, Im this information, share these images, and like I said, these are, these are our images that we've captured together, and I am very pleased that you were here along for the ride and yeah that's that's just this is exactly what I want to be doing I want to be sharing these images I want to be having more conversations about astronomy astrophotography gear and 
I am, yeah, just very happy with everything that's going um, well with the stream, going well with the uh, the equipment. And I appreciate everybody who has liked and commented. And if you can, just just let your friends know that if they're interested in space, that I am here at every opportunity given to take photos of the universe and <clears throat> and share them live on, on screen. And this is working out well because I think my voice is totally going now. So I bid you a very good night. And I am not here to change the world. I am here to share the universe. Thank you once again and have a great night.